Book 8. The Latins with the Campanians revolt, and ambassadors having been sent to the Senate, they proposed that, if they wished for peace, they should elect one of the consuls from among the Latins. Titus Manlius, the consul, put his son to death, because he had fought, though successfully, against the Latins, contrary to orders. The Romans being hard pressed in the battle, Publius Decius, then consul with Manlius, devoted himself for the army. The Latin surrender. None of the young men came out to meet Manlius on his return to the city. Minutia, a vestal virgin, was condemned for incest. Several matrons convicted of poisoning. Laws then first made against that crime. The Ausonians, Pravernians, and Palapolitans subdued. Quintus Publilius the first instance of a person continuing in command after the expiration of his office, and of a triumph decreed to any person not a consul. Law against confinement for debt. Quintus Fabius, master of the horse, fights the Samnites with success, contrary to the orders of Lucius Papirius, dictator, and, with difficulty, obtains pardon, through the intercession of the people. Successful expedition against the Samnites. The consuls now were Caius Plautius a second time, and Lucius Emilius Mamersinus, when the people of Cetia and Norba came to Rome to announce the revolt of the Pravernians, with complaints of the damages received by them. News were brought that the army of the Volscians, under the guidance of the people of Antium, had taken post at Satricum. Both wars fell by lot to Plautius. He, marching first to Pravernum, immediately came to an engagement. The enemy were defeated after a slight resistance, the town was taken, and given back to the Pravernians, a strong garrison being placed in it, two-thirds of their land were taken from them. The victorious army was marched thence to Satricum against the Antians, there a desperate battle was fought with great slaughter on both sides. And when a storm separated the combatants, hope inclining to neither side, the Romans, nowise disheartened by this so indecisive an engagement, prepare for battle against the following day. The Volscians, reckoning up what men they had lost in battle, had by no means the same spirits to repeat the risk. They went off in the night to Antium as a vanquished army in the utmost confusion, leaving behind their wounded and a part of their baggage. A vast quantity of arms was found, both among the dead bodies of the enemy, and also in the camp. These, the consul declared, that he offered up to Mother Lua, and he laid waste the enemy's country as far as the sea coast. The other consul, Emilius, on entering the Sabellan territory, found neither a camp of the Samnites nor legions opposed to him. Whilst he laid waste their territories with fire and sword, the ambassadors of the Samnites came to him, suing for peace. By whom being referred to the Senate, after leave to address them was granted, laying aside their ferocious spirits, they sued for peace for themselves from the Romans, and the right of waging war against the Citizenians. Which requests, they alleged, that, they were the more justified in making, because they had both united in friendship with the Roman people, when their affairs were flourishing, not under circumstances of distress, as the Campanians had done. And they were taking up arms against the Citizenians, ever their enemies, never the friends of the Roman people. Who had neither, as the Samnites, sought their friendship in time of peace, nor, as the Campanians, their assistance in time of war, and were neither in alliance with, nor under subjection to the Roman people. After the praetor Tiberius Emilius had consulted the Senate respecting the demands of the Samnites, and the Senate voted that the treaty should be renewed with them. The praetor returned this answer to the Samnites, that it neither had been the fault of the Roman people that their friendship with them was not perpetual. Nor was any objection made to that friendship being once more re-established, since they themselves were now become tired of a war entered into through their own fault. With respect to what regarded the Citizenians, they did not interfere with the Samnite nation having the free decision of peace and war. The treaty being concluded, on their return home, the Roman army was immediately withdrawn after they had received a year's pay, and corn for three months, for which the consul had stipulated, to grant time for a truce. Until the ambassadors should return. The Samnites having marched against the Citizenians with the same forces which they had employed in their war against the Romans, entertained rather sanguine hopes of becoming masters of the enemy's citadel. Then the Citizenians first began to surrender to the Romans. 
Afterwards, when the Senate rejected that offer as too late, and as being wrung from them by extreme necessity, it was made to the Latins, who were already taking up arms on their own account. Nor did even the Campanians, so much stronger was their recollection of the injuries done them by the Samnites than of the kindness of the Romans, keep themselves from this quarrel. Out of these so many states, one vast army, entering the territories of the Samnites under the direction of the Latins, committed more damage by depredations than by battles. And though the Latins had the advantage in the field, they retired out of the enemy's territory without reluctance, that they might not be obliged to fight too frequently. This opportunity was afforded to the Samnites to send ambassadors to Rome. When they appeared before the Senate, having complained that they, though now confederates, were subjected to the same hardships as those they had suffered as enemies, solicited, with the humblest entreaties. That, the Romans would think it enough the victory, of which they had deprived the Samnites, over their Campanian and Citizenian enemy. That they would not beside suffer them to be vanquished by these most dastardly states. That they could by their sovereign authority keep the Latins and the Campanians out of the Samnite territory, if they really were under the dominion of the Roman people, but if they rejected their authority, that they might compel them by arms. To this an equivocal answer was returned, because it was mortifying to acknowledge, that the Latins were not now in their power. And they were afraid lest by finding fault they might estrange them from their side, that the case of the Campanians was different, they having come under their protection, not by treaty but by surrender, accordingly, that the Campanians, whether they wished or not, should remain quiet, that in the Latin treaty there was no clause by which they were prevented from going to war with whomsoever they pleased. Which answer, whilst it sent away the Samnites uncertain as to what conduct they were to think that the Romans would pursue, it further estranged the Campanians through fear. It rendered the Samnites more presuming, they considering that there was nothing which the Romans would now refuse them. Wherefore, proclaiming frequent meetings under the pretext of preparing for war against the Samnites, their leading men, in their several deliberations among themselves, secretly fomented the plan of a war with Rome. In this war the Campanians too joined against their preservers. But though all their schemes were carefully concealed, and they were anxious that their Samnite enemy should be got rid of in their rear before the Romans should be aroused. Yet through the agency of some who were attached, to the latter, by private friendships and other ties, information of their conspiracy made its way to Rome, and the consuls being ordered to resign their office before the usual time. In order that the new consuls might be elected the sooner to meet so important a war, a religious scruple entered their minds at the idea of the elections being held by persons whose time of office had been cut short. Accordingly an interregnum took place. There were two interreges, Marcus Valerius and Marcus Fabius. The consuls elected were Titus Manlius Torquatus a third time, and Publius Decius Muse. It is agreed on that, in this year, Alexander, king of Epirus, made a descent on Italy with a fleet. Which war, if the first commencement had been sufficiently successful, would unquestionably have extended to the Romans. The same was the era of the exploits of Alexander the Great, whom, being son to the other sister, in another region of the world, having shown himself invincible in war, fortune cut short in his youth by disease. But the Romans, although the revolt of their allies and of the Latin nation was now no matter of doubt, yet as if they felt solicitude regarding the Samnites, not for themselves, summoned ten of the leading men of the Latins to Rome. To whom they wished to issue such orders as they might wish. Latium had at that time two praetors, Lucius Annius, a native of Cetia, and Lucius Nemigius of Circei, both from the Roman colonists. Through whose means, besides Signia and Velatri, also Roman colonies, the Volscians too had been stirred up to arms. It was determined that these two should be summoned specially. It was a matter of doubt to no one, on what matter they were sent for. Accordingly the praetors, having held an assembly, before they set out for Rome, informed them, that they were summoned by the Roman Senate and consult them as to what answer it was their wish should be given on those subjects which they thought would be discussed with them. When different persons advance different opinions, then Annius says, though I myself put the question, as to what answer it might be your pleasure should be given. Yet I think it more concerns our general interest how we should act than how we should speak. 
Your plans being once unfolded, it will be easy to suit words to the subject. For if even now we are capable of submitting to slavery under the shadow of a confederacy on equal terms, what is wanting but to betray the Citizenians, be obedient to the orders not only of the Romans, but of the Samnites, and tell the Romans. That we will lay down our arms whenever they intimate it to be their wish. But if at length the desire of liberty stimulates your minds, if a confederacy does subsist, if alliance be equalization of rights, if there be reason now to boast that we are of the same blood as the Romans, of which they were formerly ashamed. If they have such an army of allies, by the junction of which they may double their strength, such a one as their consuls would be unwilling to separate from themselves either in concluding or commencing their own wars. Why are not all things equalized? Why is not one of the consuls chosen from the Latins? Where there is an equal share of strength, is there also an equal share in the government? This indeed in itself reflects no extraordinary degree of honor on us, as still acknowledging Rome to be the metropolis of Latium, but that it may possibly appear to do so, has been affected by our long-continued forbearance. But if ye ever wished for an opportunity of sharing in the government, and enjoying freedom, lo! This opportunity is now at hand, presented both by your own valor and the bounty of the gods. Ye have tried their patience by refusing them soldiers. Who doubts that they were fired with rage, when we broke through a custom of more than two hundred years? Still they submitted to this feeling of resentment. We waged war with the Polygnians in our own name. They who formerly did not even concede to us the right of defending our own territories through ourselves, interfered not. They heard that the Citizenians were received under our protection, that the Campanians had revolted from themselves to us, that we were preparing armies against their confederates, the Samnites, yet they stirred not from the city. Whence this so great forbearance on their part, except from a knowledge of our strength and their own? I have it from competent authority, that when the Samnites complained of us, such an answer was given them by the Roman Senate, as plainly showed that not even themselves insisted that Latium was under the Roman jurisdiction. Only assume your rights in demanding that which they tacitly concede to you. If fear prevents any one from saying this, lo! I pledge myself that I will say it, in the hearing not only of the Roman people and Senate, but of Jupiter himself, who inhabits the capital. That if they wish us to be in confederacy and alliance with them, they are to receive one consul from us, and one half of the Senate. When he not only recommended these measures boldly, but promised also his aid, they all, with acclamations of assent, permitted him to do and say whatever might appear to him conducive to the Republic of the Latin nation in his own honor. When they arrived in Rome, an audience of the Senate was granted them in the capital. There, when Titus Manlius the consul, by direction of the Senate, required of them not to make war on their confederates the Samnites, Annius, as if he had taken the capital by arms as a victor. And were not addressing them as an ambassador protected by the law of nations, says, it were time, Titus Manlius, and you, conscript fathers, to cease at length treating with us on a footing of superiority. When you see Latium in a most flourishing state by the bounty of the gods in arms and men, the Samnites being vanquished in war, the Citizenians and Campanians are allies, the Volscians now united to us in alliance. And that your own colonies even prefer the government of Latium to that of Rome. But since you do not bring your minds to put an end to your arbitrary despotism, we, though able by force of arms to vindicate the independence of Latium, yet will make this concession to the ties of blood between us. As to offer terms of peace on terms of equality for both, since it has pleased the immortal gods that the strength of both is equalized. One of the consuls must be selected out of Rome, the other out of Latium, an equal portion of the Senate must be from both nations, we must be one people, one republic. And that the seat of government may be the same, and we all may have the same name, since the concession must be made by the one party or other, let this, and may it be auspicious to both, have the advantage of being the mother country. And let us all be called Romans. It so happened that the Romans also had a consul, a match for this man's high spirit. Who, so far from restraining his angry feelings, openly declared, that if such infatuation took possession of the conscript fathers, that they would receive laws from a man of Cetia, he would himself come into the senate armed with a sword. 
and would slay with his hand any Latin whom he should see in the Senate house. And turning to the statue of Jupiter, Hear thou, Jupiter, says he, hear these impious proposals, hear ye them, justice and equity. Jupiter, art thou to behold foreign consuls in the foreign senate in thy consecrated temple, as if thou wert a captive and overpowered? Were these the treaties which Tullus, a Roman king, concluded with the Albans, your forefathers, Latins, and which Lucius Tarquinius subsequently concluded with you? Does not the battle at the Lake Regillus occur to your thoughts? Have you so forgotten your own calamities and our kindnesses towards you? When the indignation of the Senate followed these words of the consul, it is recorded that, in reply to the frequent appeals to the gods, whom the consuls frequently invoked as witnesses to the treaties. An expression of Aeneas was heard in contempt of the divinity of the Roman Jupiter. Certainly, when aroused with wrath he was proceeding with rapid steps from the porch of the temple, having fallen down the stairs, his head being severely struck, he was dashed against a stone at the bottom with such force. As to be deprived of sense. As all writers do not say that he was killed, I too shall leave it in doubt, as also the circumstance, that a storm, with a dreadful noise in the heavens, took place during the appeal made in reference to the violated treaties. For they may both be true, and also invented aptly to express in a striking manner the resentment of heaven. Torquatus, being dispatched by the Senate to dismiss the ambassadors, on seeing Aeneas lying prostrate, exclaimed, so as that his voice was heard both by the people and the Senate, it is well. The gods have excited a just war. There is a deity in heaven. Thou dost exist, great Jove, not without reason have we consecrated thee the father of gods and men in this mansion. Why do ye hesitate, Romans, and you, conscript fathers, to take up arms under the direction of the gods. Thus will I lay low the legions of the Latins, as you now see this man lying prostrate. The words of the consul, received with the approbation of the people, filled their breasts with such ardor, that the ambassadors on their departure were protected from the anger and violence of the people more by the care of the magistrates, who escorted them by order of the consul, than by the law of nations. The Senate also voted for the war. And the consuls, after raising two armies, marched into the territories of the Marsians and Polygnians, the army of the Samnites having joined them, and pitched their camp near Capua, where the Latins and their allies had now assembled. There it is said there appeared to both the consuls, during sleep, the same form of a man larger and more majestic than human, who said, of the one side a general, of the other an army was due to the Diomenes and to Mother Earth. From whichever army a general should devote the legions of the enemy in himself, in addition, that the victory would belong to that nation and that party. When the consuls compared together these visions of the night, it was resolved that victims should be slain for the purpose of averting the anger of the gods. At the same time, that if the same portents were exhibited in the entrails as those which had been seen during sleep, either of the consuls should fulfill the fates. When the answers of the Haruspices coincided with the secret religious impression already implanted in their minds. Then, having brought together the lieutenant generals and tribunes, and having openly expounded to them the commands of the gods, they settle among themselves, lest the consul's voluntary death should intimidate the army in the field. That on which side soever the Roman army should commence to give way, the consul in that quarter should devote himself for the Roman people and the Karites. In this consultation it was also suggested, that if ever on any occasion any war had been conducted with strict discipline, then indeed military discipline should be reduced to the ancient standard. What excited their attention particularly was, that they had to contend against Latins, who coincided with themselves in long gauge, manners, in the same kind of arms, and more especially in military institutions. Soldiers had been mixed with soldiers, centurions with centurions, tribunes with tribunes, as comrades and colleagues, in the same armies, and often in the same companies. Lest in consequence of this the soldiers should be involved in any mistake, the consuls issue orders that no one should fight against an enemy out of his post. It happened that among the other prefects of the troops, who had been sent out in all directions to reconnoitre, Titus Manlius, the consul's son, came with his troop to the back of the enemy's camp. So near that he was scarcely distant a dart's throw from the next post. 
In that place were some Tusculan cavalry, they were commanded by Geminus Medius, a man distinguished among his countrymen both by birth and exploits. When he recognized the Roman cavalry, and conspicuous among them the consul's son marching at their head, for they were all known to each other, especially the men of note, Romans. Are ye going to wage war with the Latins and allies with a single troop? What in the interim will the consuls, what will the two consular armies be doing? They will be here in good time, says Manlius, and with them will be Jupiter himself, as a witness of the treaties violated by you, who is stronger and more powerful. If we fought at the Lake Regillus until you had quite enough, here also we shall so act, that a line of battle and an encounter with us may afford you no very great gratification. In reply to this, Geminus, advancing some distance from his own party, says, Do you choose then, until that day arrives on which you are to put your armies in motion with such mighty labor, to enter the lists with me? That from the result of a contest between us both, it may be seen how much a Latin excels a Roman horseman. Either resentment, or shame at declining the contest, or the invincible power of fate, arouses the determined spirit of the youth. Forgetful therefore of his father's command, and the consul's edict, he is driven headlong to that contest, in which it made not much difference whether he conquered or was conquered. The other horsemen being removed to a distance as if to witness the sight, in the space of clear ground which lay between them they spurred on their horses against each other. And when they were together in fierce encounter, the spear of Manlius passed over the helmet of his antagonist, that of Metius across the neck of the other's horse. Then wheeling round their horses, when Manlius arose to repeat the blow, he fixed his javelin between the ears of his opponent's horse. When, by the pain of this wound, the horse, having raised his four feet on high, tossed his head with great violence, he shook off his rider, whom, when he was raising himself from the severe fall, by leaning on his spear and buckler. Manlius pierced through the throat, so that the steel passed out through the ribs, and pinned him to the earth. And having collected the spoils, he returned to his own party, and with his troop, who were exulting with joy, he proceeds to the camp, and thence to the general's tent to his father, ignorant of what awaited him. Whether praise or punishment had been merited. Father, says he, that all may truly represent me as sprung from your blood, when challenged, I slew my adversary, and have taken from him these equestrian spoils. When the consul heard this, immediately turning away from his son, he ordered an assembly to be summoned by sound of trumpet. When these assembled in great numbers, since you, Titus Manlius, says he, revering neither the consular power or a father's majesty, have fought against the enemy out of your post contrary to our orders, and, as far as in you lay, have subverted military discipline, by which the Roman power has stood to this day, and have brought me to this necessity, that I must either forget the Republic, or myself and mine. We shall expiate our own transgressions rather than the Republic should sustain so serious a loss for our misdeeds. We shall be a melancholy example, but a profitable one, to the youth of future ages. As for me, both the natural affection for my children, as well as that instance of bravery which has led you astray by the false notion of honor, affects me for you. But since either the authority of consuls is to be established by your death, or by your forgiveness to be for ever annulled, I do not think that even you, if you have any of our blood in you, will refuse to restore, by your punishment, the military discipline which has been subverted by your misconduct. Go, Lictor, bind him to the stake. All became motionless, more through fear than discipline, astounded by so cruel an order, each looking on the axe as if drawn against himself. Therefore when they stood in profound silence, suddenly, when the blood spouted from his severed neck, their minds recovering, as it were, from a state of stupefaction, then their voices arose together in free expressions of complaint. So that they spared neither lamentations nor execrations, and the body of the youth, being covered with the spoils, was burned on a pile erected outside the rampart. With all the military zeal with which any funeral could be celebrated, and Monlian orders were considered with horror, not only for the present, but of the most austere severity for future times. The severity of the punishment however rendered the soldiers more obedient to the general. And besides that the guards and watches and the regulation of the posts were everywhere more strictly attended to, 
such severity was also profitable in the final struggle when they came into the field of battle. But the battle was very like to a civil war, so very similar was everything among the Romans and Latins, except with respect to courage. The Romans formerly used targets. Afterwards, when they began to receive pay, they made shields instead of targets, and what before constituted phalanxes similar to the Macedonian, afterwards became a line drawn up in distinct companies. At length they were divided into several centuries. A century contained sixty soldiers, two centurions, and one standard bearer. The spearmen, Hastati, formed the first line in fifteen companies, with small intervals between them, a company had twenty light armed soldiers, the rest wearing shields, those were called light who carried only a spear and short iron javelins. This, which constituted the van in the field of battle, contained the youth in early bloom advancing towards the age of service. Next followed men of more robust age, in the same number of companies, who were called principes, all wearing shields, and distinguished by the completest armor. This band of thirty companies they called Antipolani, because there were fifteen others placed behind them with the standards, of which each company consisted of three divisions, and the first division of each they called a pilus. Each company consisted of three ensigns, and contained 186 men. The first ensign was at the head of the triarii, veteran soldiers of tried bravery. The second, at the head of the rorarii, men whose ability was less by reason of their age and course of service, the third, at the head of the exensi, a body in whom very little confidence was reposed. For this reason also they were thrown back to the rear. When the army was marshaled according to this arrangement, the spearmen first commenced the fight. If the spearmen were unable to repulse the enemy, they retreated leisurely, and were received by the principes into the intervals of the ranks. The fight then devolved on the principes, the spearmen followed. The triarii continued kneeling behind the ensigns, their left leg extended forward, holding their shields resting on their shoulders, and their spears fixed in the ground, with the points erect. So that their line bristled as if enclosed by a rampart. If the principes also did not make sufficient impression in the fight, they retreated slowly from the front to the triarii. Hence, when a difficulty is felt, matters have come to the triarii, became a usual proverb. The triarii rising up, after receiving the principes and spearmen into the intervals between their ranks, immediately closing their files, shut up as it were the openings. And in one compact body fell upon the enemy, no other hope being now left, that was the most formidable circumstance to the enemy, when having pursued them as vanquished, they beheld a new line suddenly starting up, increased also in strength. In general about four legions were raised, each consisting of five thousand infantry and three hundred horse. As many more were added from the Latin levy, who were at that time enemies to the Romans, and drew up their line after the same manner. And they knew that unless the ranks were disturbed they would have to engage not only standard with standard, spearman with spearman, principes with principes, but centurion also with centurion. There were among the veterans two first centurions in either army, the Roman by no means possessing bodily strength, but a brave man, and experienced in the service, the Latin powerful in bodily strength, and a first-rate warrior. They were very well known to each other, because they had always held equal rank. The Roman, somewhat diffident of his strength, had at Rome obtained permission from the consuls, to select any one whom he wished, his own sub-centurion, to protect him from the one destined to be his adversary. And this youth being opposed to him in the battle, obtained the victory over the Latin centurion. They came to an engagement not far from the foot of Mount Vesuvius, where the road led to the Veserus. The Roman consuls, before they marched out their armies to the field, offered sacrifices. The Aruspex is said to have shown to Decius the head of the liver wounded on the side relating to himself, in other respects the victim was acceptable to the gods, whilst Manlius obtained highly favourable omens from his sacrifice. But all is well, says Decius, if my colleague has offered an acceptable sacrifice. The ranks being drawn up in the order already described, they marched forth to battle. Manlius commanded the right, Decius the left wing. At first the action was conducted with equal strength on both sides, and with the same ardent courage. 
Afterwards the Roman spearmen on the left wing, not sustaining the violent assault of the Latins, betook themselves to the Principes. In this state of trepidation the consul Decius cries out with a loud voice to Marcus Valerius, Valerius, we have need of the aid of the gods. Come, as public pontiff of the Roman people, dictate to me the words in which I may devote myself for the legions. The pontiff directed him to take the gown called pretexta, and with his head covered and his hand thrust out under the gown to the chin, standing upon a spear placed under his feet, to say these words, Janus, Jupiter, Father Mars, Quirinus. Bologna, ye Laras, ye gods novensals, ye gods indigites, ye divinities, under whose power we and our enemies are, and ye diamenes, I pray you, I adore you, I ask your favor. That you would prosperously grant strength and victory to the Roman people, the Karites. And that ye may affect the enemies of the Roman people, the Karites, with terror, dismay, and death. In such manner as I have expressed in words, so do I devote the legions and auxiliaries of the enemy, together with myself, to the Diamenes and to earth for the Republic of the Karites, for the army, legions, auxiliaries of the Roman people. The Karites. Having uttered this prayer, he orders the lictors to go to Titus Manlius, and without delay to announce to his colleague that he had devoted himself for the army. He, girding himself in a gabin cincture, and fully armed, mounted his horse, and rushed into the midst of the enemy. He was observed by both armies to present a more majestic appearance than human, as one sent from heaven as an expiation of all the wrath of the gods, to transfer to the enemy destruction turned away from his own side, accordingly. All the terror and panic being carried along with him, at first disturbed the battalions of the Latins, then completely pervaded their entire line. This was most evident, because, in whatever direction he was carried with his horse, there they became panic-stricken, as if struck by some pestilential constellation. But when he fell overwhelmed with darts, instantly the cohorts of the Latins, thrown into manifest consternation, took to flight, leaving a void to a considerable extent. At the same time also the Romans, their minds being freed from religious dread, exerting themselves as if the signal was then given for the first time, commenced a fight with renewed ardor. For the Rorarii also pushed forward among the Antipolani, and added strength to the spearmen and principes, and the Triarii resting on the right knee awaited the consul's nod to rise up. Afterwards, as the contest proceeded, when the superior numbers of the Latins had the advantage in some places, the consul, Manlius, on hearing the circumstance of his colleague's death, after he had, as was right and just, honored his so glorious a death with tears, as well as with praises so well merited, hesitated, for a little time, whether it was yet time for the Triarii to rise. Then judging it better that they should be kept fresh for the decisive blow, he ordered the Accensi to advance from the rear before the standards. When they moved forward, the Latins immediately called up their Triarii, as if their opponents had done the same thing, who, when they had by desperate fighting for a considerable time both fatigued themselves, and had either broken or blunted their spears, and were, however, beating back their adversaries, thinking that the battle was now nearly decided, and that they had come to the last line. Then the consul calls to the Triarii, Arise now, fresh as ye are, against men now wearied, mindful of your country and parents, your wives and children, mindful of your consul who has submitted to death to ensure your victory. When the Triarii arose, fresh as they were, with their arms glittering, a new line which appeared unexpectedly, receiving the Antipolani into the intervals between the ranks, raised a shout, and broke through the first line of the Latins. And goading their faces, after cutting down those who constituted their principal strength, they passed almost intact through the other companies, with such slaughter that they scarcely left one-fourth of the enemy. The San Knights also, drawn up at a distance at the foot of the mountain, struck terror into the Latins. But of all, whether citizens or allies, the principal praise for that action was due to the consuls. The one of whom turned on himself alone all the threats and dangers, denounced, by the divinities of heaven and hell. The other evinced such valor and such judgment in the battle, that it was universally agreed among both the Romans and Latins who have transmitted to posterity an account of the battle, that, on whichever side Titus Manlius held the command. The victory must belong to that.
the Latins in their flight betook themselves to Minterni. Immediately after the battle the camp was taken, and great numbers still alive were surprised therein, chiefly Campanians. Night surprised them in their search, and prevented the body of Decius from being discovered on that day. On the day after it was found amid vast heaps of slaughtered enemies, pierced with a great number of darts, and his funeral was solemnized under the direction of his colleague, in a manner suited to his death. It seems right to add here, that it is lawful for a consul, a dictator, and a praetor, when he devotes the legions of the enemy, to devote not himself particularly. But whatever citizen he may choose out of a Roman legion regularly enrolled, if the person who has been devoted die, the matter is duly performed. If he do not perish, then an image, seven feet high or more, must be buried in the ground, and a victim slain, as an expiation. Where that image shall be buried, there it is not lawful that a Roman magistrate should pass. But if he wish to devote himself, as Decius did, unless he who has devoted himself die, he shall not with propriety perform any act of religion regarding either himself or the public. Should he wish to devote his arms to Vulcan or to any other god, he has a right, whether he shall please, by a victim, or in any other manner. It is not proper that the enemy should get possession of the weapon, on which the consul, standing, pronounced the imprecation, if they should get possession of it, then an expiation must be made to Mars by the sacrifices called the Suove Terilia. Although the memory of every divine and human custom has been obliter aided, in consequence of preferring what is modern and foreign to that which is ancient and belonging to our own country. I deemed it not irrelevant to relate the particulars even in the very terms used, as they have been handed down and expressed. I find it stated in some writers, that the Samnites, having awaited the issue of the battle, came at length with support to the Romans after the battle was over. Also aid from Lavinium, whilst they wasted time in deliberating, was at length sent to the Latins after they had been vanquished. And when the first standards and part of the army just issued from the gates, news being brought of the defeat of the Latins, they faced about and returned back to the city. On which occasion they say that their praetor, Milionius, observed, that, for so very short a journey a high price must be paid to the Romans. Such of the Latins as survived the battle, after being scattered over many roads, collected themselves into a body, and found refuge in the city of Vesia. There their general, Nemigius, insisted in their counsels, that, the truly common fortune of war had prostrated both armies by equal losses, and that only the name of victory rested with the Romans. That in other respects they too shared the lot of defeated persons, the two pavilions of the consuls were polluted, one by the murder committed on a son, the other by the blood of a devoted consul, that their army was cut down in every direction. Their spearmen and principes were cut down, great havoc was made before the standards and behind them, the triarii at length restored their cause. Though the forces of the Latins were cut down in an equal proportion, yet for reinforcements, Latium or the Volscians were nearer than Rome. Wherefore, if they thought well of it, he would speedily call out the youth from the Latin and Volscian states, and would return to Capua with a determined army, and by his unexpected arrival strike dismay among the Romans. Who were expecting nothing less than battle. Deceptive letters being sent around Latium and the Volscian nation, a tumultuary army, hastily raised from all quarters, was assembled, for as they had not been present at the battle, they were more disposed to believe on slight grounds. This army the consul Torquatus met at Trisanum, a place between Sinuessa and Minterni. Before a place was selected for a camp, the baggage on both sides being piled up in a heap, they fought and terminated the war. For so impaired was their strength, that all the Latins surrendered themselves to the consul, who was leading his victorious army to lay waste their lands, and the Campanians followed the example of this surrender. Latium and Capua were fined some land. The Latin with the addition of the Privernian land, and the Falernian land, which had belonged to the people of Campania, as far as the river Volturnus, is all distributed to the commons of Rome. In the Latin land two acres a man were assigned, so that they should receive an additional three-fourths of an acre from the Privernian land. In the Falernian land three acres were assigned, one-fourth of an acre being further added, in consideration of the distance. Of the Latins the Laurentians were exempted from punishment, as also the horsemen of the Campanians, 
because they had not revolted. An order was issued that the treaty should be renewed with the Laurentians. And it is renewed every year since, on the tenth day after the Latin festival. The rights of citizenship were granted to the Campanian horsemen, and that it might serve as a memorial, they hung up a brazen tablet in the Temple of Castor at Rome. The Campanian state was also enjoined to pay them a yearly stipend of 450 denarii each, their number amounted to 1,600. The war being thus concluded, after rewards and punishment were distributed according to the deserts of each, Titus Manlius returned to Rome, on his approach it appears that the aged only went forth to meet him. And that the young men, both then, and all his life after, detested and cursed him. The Antians made incursions on the territories of Ostia, Ardia, and Solonia. The consul Manlius, because he was unable by reason of his health to conduct that war, nominated as dictator Lucius Papirius Crassus, who then happened to be praetor, by him Lucius Papirius Cursor was appointed master of the horse. Nothing worthy of mention was performed against the Antians by the dictator, although he had kept a standing camp for several months in the Antian territory. To a year signalized by a victory over so many in such powerful states, further by the illustrious death of one of the consuls, as well as by the unrelenting, though memorable, severity of command in the other. There succeeded as consuls Titus Emilius Mamersinus and Quintus Publilius Philo. Neither to a similar opportunity of exploits, and they themselves being mindful rather of their own interests as well as of those of the parties in the state, than of the interests of their country. They routed on the plains of Ferentinum, and stripped of their camp, the Latins, who, in resentment of the land they had lost, took up arms again. Publilius, under whose guidance and auspices the action had been fought, receiving the submission of the Latin states, who had lost a great many of their young men there, Emilius marched the army to Pedum. The people of Pedum were supported by the states of Tiber, Prenest, and Velatri, auxiliaries had also come from Lanuvium and Antium. Where, though the Romans had the advantage in several engagements, still the entire labor remained at the city of Pedum itself and at the camp of the allied states, which was adjoining the city, suddenly leaving the war unfinished. Because he heard that a triumph was decreed to his colleague, he himself also returned to Rome to demand a triumph before a victory had been obtained. The Senate displeased by this ambitious conduct, and refusing a triumph unless Pedum was either taken or should surrender, Emilius, alienated from the Senate in consequence of this act, administered the remainder of the consulship like to a seditious tribuneship. For, as long as he was consul, he neither ceased to criminate the patricians to the people, his colleague by no means interfering, because he himself also was a plebeian. The scanty distribution of the land among the commons in the Latin and Falernian territory afforded the groundwork of the crimination's winky face. And when the Senate, wishing to put an end to the administration of the consuls, ordered a dictator to be nominated against the Latins, who were again in arms, Emilius, to whom the Fasces then belonged, nominated his colleague dictator. By him Junius Brutus was constituted master of the horse. The dictatorship was popular, both in consequence of his discourses containing invectives against the patricians, and because he passed three laws, most advantageous to the commons, and injurious to the nobility. 1. That the orders of the commons should be binding on all the Romans, another, that the patricians should, before the suffrages commenced, declare their approbation of the laws which should be passed in the assemblies of the centuries. The third, that one at least of the censors should be elected from the commons, as they had already gone so far as that it was lawful that both the consuls should be plebeians. The patricians considered that more of detriment had been sustained on that year from the consuls and dictator than was counterbalanced by their success and achievements abroad. On the following year, Lucius Furius Camillus and Caius Manius were consuls, in order that the neglect of his duty by Emilius, the consul of the preceding year, might be rendered more markedly reproachful. The Senate loudly urged that Pedum should be assailed with arms, men, and every kind of force, and be demolished. And the new consuls, being forced to give that matter the precedence of all others, set out on that expedition. The state of affairs was now such in Latium, that they could no longer submit to either war or peace. For war they were deficient in resources, they spurned at peace through resentment for the loss of their land. 
It seemed necessary therefore to steer a middle course, to keep within their towns, so that the Romans by being provoked might have no pretext for hostilities. And that if the siege of any town should be announced to them, aid should be sent from every quarter from all the states. And still the people of Pedum were aided by only a very few states. The Tibertians and Prenestans, whose territory lay nearest, came to Pedum. Manius suddenly making an attack, defeated the Aracinians, and Lanuvians, and Valaternians, at the river Astura, the Volscians of Antium forming a junction with them. The Tibertian, far the strongest body, Camillus engages at Pedum, encountering much greater difficulty, though with a result equally successful. A sudden sally of the townsmen during the battle chiefly occasioned confusion, Camillus, turning on these with a part of his army, not only drove them within their walls, but on the very same day. After he had discomfited themselves and their auxiliaries, he took the town by scalade. It was then resolved to lead round with greater energy and spirit his victorious army from the storming of a single city to the entire conquest of Latium. Nor did they stop until they reduced all Latium, either by storming, or by becoming masters of the cities one after the other by capitulation. Then, disposing garrisons in the towns which they had taken, they departed to Rome to a triumph universally admitted to be due to them. To the triumph was added the honor of having equestrian statues erected to them in the Forum, a compliment very unusual at that period. Before they commenced holding the meeting for the election of the consuls for the ensuing year, Camillus moved the Senate concerning the Latin states, and spoke thus, Conscript Fathers. That which was to be done by war and arms in Latium has now been fully accomplished by the bounty of the gods and the valor of the soldiers. The armies of the enemy have been cut down at Pedum and the Astura. All the Latin towns, and Antium belonging to the Volscians, either taken by storm, or received into surrender, are occupied by your garrisons. It now remains to be considered, since they annoy us by their repeated rebellions, how we may keep them in quiet submission and in the observance of perpetual peace. The immortal gods have put the determination of this matter so completely in your power, that they have placed it at your option whether Latium is to exist henceforward or not. Ye can therefore ensure to yourselves perpetual peace, as far as regards the Latins, either by adopting severe or lenient measures. Do ye choose to adopt cruel conduct towards people who have surrendered and have been conquered? Ye may destroy all Latium, make a vast desert of a place whence, in many and serious wars, ye have often made use of an excellent army of allies. Do you wish, according to the example of your ancestors, to augment the Roman state by admitting the vanquished among your citizens? Materials for extending your power by the highest glory are at hand. That government is certainly by far the most secure, which the subjects feel a pleasure in obeying. But whatever determination ye wish to come to, it is necessary that it be speedy. So many states have ye in a state of suspense between hope and fear. And it is necessary that you be discharged as soon as possible of your solicitude about them, and that their minds, whilst they are still in a state of insensibility from uncertainty, be at once impressed either by punishment or clemency. It was our duty to bring matters to such a pass that you may have full power to deliberate on every matter, yours to decide what is most expedient to yourselves and the commonwealth. The principal members of the Senate applauded the consul's statement of the business on the whole. But said that, as the states were differently circumstanced, that their plan might be readily adjusted so that it might be determined according to the desert of each, if they should put the question regarding each state specifically. The question was therefore so put regarding each separately and a decree passed. To the Lanuvians the right of citizenship was granted, and the exercise of their religious rights was restored to them with this provision. That the temple and grove of Juno Sospita should be common between the Lanuvian burghers and the Roman people. The Oritians, Nomentans, and Pedans were admitted into the number of citizens on the same terms as the Lanuvians. To the Tusculans the rights of citizenship which they already possessed were continued. And the crime of rebellion was turned from disaffection on public grounds against a few instigators. On the Velaternians, Roman citizens of long standing, measures of great severity were inflicted because they had so often rebelled. Their walls were raised, and their senate removed from thence, and they were ordered to dwell on the other side of the Tiber. 
so that the fine of any individual who should be caught on the hither side of that river should amount to one thousand asses. And that the person who had apprehended him, should not discharge his prisoner from confinement, until the money was paid down. Into the land of the senator's colonists were sent. From the additions of which Velletri recovered its appearance of former populousness. A new colony was also sent to Antium, with this provision, that if the Antians desired to be enrolled as colonists, permission to that effect should be granted. Their ships of war were removed from thence, and the people of Antium were interdicted the sea, and the rights of citizenship were granted them. The Tibertians and Prenestans were immersed in some land, not only on account of the recent guilt of the rebellion, which was common to them with the other Latins. But also because, from their dislike to the Roman government, they had formerly associated in arms with the Gauls, a nation of savages. From the other Latin states they took away the privileges of intermarriage, commerce, and of holding meetings. To the Campanians, in compliment to their horsemen, because they had refused to join in rebellion with the Latins, and to the Fundans and Formians, because the passage through their territories had been always secure and peaceful. The freedom of the state was granted with the right of suffrage. It was determined that the people of Cumi and Suesula should have the same rights and be on the same footing as Capua. Of the ships of the Antians some were drawn up to the docks at Rome, some were burned, and with the prows of these a pulpit built in the forum was ordered to be decorated, and that temple was called Rostra. During the consulship of Caius Sulpicius Longus and Publius Aelius Paetus, when the Roman power not more than the kindly feeling engendered by acts of kindness diffused the blessings of peace among all parties. A war broke out between the Citizenians and Oruncans. The Oruncans having been admitted into alliance on the occasion of their surrendering, had since that period made no disturbance, accordingly they had a juster pretext for seeking aid from the Romans. But before the consuls led forth their army from the city, for the senate had ordered the Oruncans to be defended, intelligence is brought that the Oruncans deserted their town through fear, and flying with their wives and children. That they fortified Suessa, which is now called Orunca. That their ancient walls and city were demolished by the Citizenians. The senate being in consequence incensed against the consuls, by whose delays the allies had been betrayed, ordered a dictator to be created. Caius Claudius Regilensis was appointed, and he nominated Caius Claudius Hortator as master of the horse. A scruple afterwards arose concerning the dictator. And when the augurs declared that he seemed to have been created under an informality, the dictator and the master of the horse laid down their office. This year Minutia, a vestal, at first suspected on account of her dress being more elegant than was becoming, afterwards being arraigned before the pontiffs on the testimony of a slave. After she had been ordered by their decree to abstain from meddling in sacred rites, and to keep her slaves under her own power, when brought to trial, was buried alive at the Colleen Gate, on the right of the causeway, in the field of wickedness. I suppose that name was given to the place from her crime. On the same year Quintus Publilius Philo was the first of the plebeians elected praetor, being opposed by Sulpicius the consul, who refused to take any notice of him as a candidate. The Senate, as they had not SUCC'd on that ground in the case of the highest offices, being less earnest with respect to the praetorship. The following year, Lucius Papirius Crassus and Ciso Duilius being consuls, was distinguished by a war with the Ausonians, as being new rather than important. This people inhabited the city Callus. They had united their arms with their neighbors the Citizenians. And the army of the two states being defeated in one battle scarcely worthy of record, was induced to take to flight the earlier in consequence of the proximity of the cities, and the more sheltered on their flight. Nor did the Senate, however, discontinue their attention to that war, because the Citizenians had now so often taken up arms either as principals, or had afforded aid to those who did so, or had been the cause of hostilities. Accordingly they exerted themselves with all their might, to raise to the consulship for the fourth time, Marcus Valerius Corvus, the greatest general of that day. To Corvus was added Marcus Attilius Regulus as colleague. And lest any disappointment might by any chance occur, a request was made of the consuls, that, without drawing lots, that province might be assigned to Corvus. Receiving the victorious army from the former consuls, proceeding to Callus, whence the war had originated, after he had, 
at the first shout and onset, routed the enemy, who were disheartened by the recollection also of the former engagement. He set about attacking the town itself. And such was the ardor of the soldiers, that they wished to advance immediately up to the walls, and strenuously asserted that they would scale them. Corvus, because that was a hazardous undertaking, wished to accomplish his object rather by the labor than the risk of his men. Accordingly he formed a rampart, prepared his vinii, and advanced towers up to the walls. But an opportunity which accidentally presented itself, prevented the occasion for them. For Martius Fabius, a Roman prisoner, when, having broken his chains during the inattention of his guards on a festival day, suspending himself by means of a rope which was fastened to a battlement of the wall, he let himself down by the hands. Persuaded the general to make an assault on the enemy whilst stupefied by wine and feasting. Nor were the Ausonians, together with their city, captured with greater difficulty than they had been routed in the field. A great amount of booty was obtained, and a garrison being stationed at Callus, the legions were marched back to Rome. The consul triumphed in pursuance of a decree of the Senate, and that Attilius might not be without a share of glory, both the consuls were ordered to lead the army against the Citizenians. But first, in conformity with a decree of the Senate, they nominated as dictator for the purpose of holding the elections, Lucius Emilius Mamersinus, he named Quintus Publilius Philo his master of the horse. The dictator presiding at the elections, Titus Veturius and Spurius Postumius were elected consuls. Though a part of the war with the Citizenians still remained. Yet that they might anticipate, by an act of kindness, the wishes of the commons, they proposed about sending a colony to Callus. And a decree of the Senate being passed that 2,500 men should be enrolled for that purpose, they appointed Kiso Duilius, Titus Quinctius, and Marcus Fabius commissioners for conducting the colony and distributing the land. The new consuls then, recovering the army from their predecessors, entered the enemy's territories and carried their depredations up to the walls and the city. There because the Citizenians, who had raised a numerous army, seemed determined to fight vigorously for their last hope, and a report existed that Samnium also was preparing for hostilities. Publius Cornelius Rufinus was created dictator by the consuls in pursuance of a decree of the Senate. Marcus Antonius was nominated master of the horse. A scruple afterwards arose that they were elected under an informality, and they laid down their office. And because a pestilence followed, recourse was had to an interregnum, as if all the auspices had been infected by that irregularity. By Marcus Valerius Corvus, the fifth interrex from the commencement of the interregnum, Aulus Cornelius a second time, and Gnaeus Domitius were elected consuls. Things being now tranquil, the rumor of a Gallic war had the effect of a real outbreak, so that they were determined that a dictator should be nominated. Marcus Papirius Crassus was nominated, and Publius Valerius Publicola master of the horse. And when the levy was conducted by them with more activity than was deemed necessary in the case of neighboring wars, scouts were sent out and brought word, that there was perfect quiet with the Gauls in every direction. It was suspected that Samnium also was now for the second year in a state of disturbance in consequence of their entertaining new designs, hence the Roman troops were not withdrawn from the Citizenian territory. But a hostile attack made by Alexander of Epirus on the Lucanians drew away the attention of the Samnites to another quarter, these two nations fought a pitched battle against the king, as he was making a descent on the district adjoining Pestum. Alexander, having come off victorious in that contest, concluded a peace with the Romans, with what fidelity he would have kept it, if his other projects had been equally successful, is uncertain. The same year the census was performed, and the new citizens were raided, on their account the Meshan and Scaption tribes were added, the censors who added them were Quintus Publilius Philo and Spurius Postumius. The Assyrians were enrolled as Romans, in conformity with a law introduced by the praetor, Lucius Papirius, by which the right of citizenship with the privilege of suffrage was conferred. These were the transactions at home and abroad during that year. The following year was disastrous, whether by the intemperature of the air, or by human guilt, Marcus Claudius Marcellus and Caius Valerius being consuls. I find in the annals Flaccus and Potidus variously given as the surname of the consul, but in this it is of little consequence which is the true one. 
I would heartily wish that this other account were a false one, nor indeed do all writers mention it, viz. That those persons, whose death rendered the year signal for the pestilence, were carried off by poison. The circumstance however must be stated as it is handed down to us, that I may not detract from the credit of any writer. When the principal persons of the state were dying of similar diseases, and all generally with the same result, a certain maidservant undertook, before Quintius Fabius Maximus, Curul Edile, to discover the cause of the public malady. Provided the public faith would be given to her by him, that the discovery should not be made detrimental to her. Fabius immediately lays the matter before the consuls, and the consuls before the senate, and with the concurrence of that order the public faith was pledged to the informer. It was then disclosed that the state was afflicted by the wickedness of certain women, and that certain matrons were preparing those poisonous drugs, and if they wished to follow her forthwith, they might be detected in the very fact. Having followed the informer, they found women preparing certain drugs, and others of the same kind laid up. These being brought into the forum, and several matrons, to the number of twenty, in whose possession they had been detected, being summoned by the beadle, two of them, Cornelia and Sergia, both of patrician rank. Maintaining that these drugs were wholesome, were directed by the informer who confronted them to drink some, that they might convict her of having stated what was false. Having taken time to confer together, when, the crowd being removed, they referred the matter to the other matrons in the open view of all, they also not refusing to drink, they all drank of the preparation, and perished by their own wicked device. Their attendants being instantly seized, informed against a great number of matrons, of whom to the number of one hundred and seventy were condemned. Nor up to that day was there ever an inquiry made at Rome concerning poisoning. The circumstance was considered a prodigy, and seemed the act rather of insane persons than of persons depraved by guilt. Wherefore mention having been found in the annals, that formerly in the secessions of the commons the nail had been driven by the dictator, and that the minds of the people, distracted by discord, had been restored to a sane state. It was determined that a dictator should be nominated for the purpose of driving the nail. Gnaeus Quinctilius being nominated, appointed Lucius Valerius master of the horse, who, as soon as the nail was driven, abdicated their offices. Lucius Papirius Crassus a second time, and Lucius Plautius Veno were elected consuls. At the commencement of which year ambassadors came to Rome from the Fabriturnians, a Volscian people, and from the Lucanians, soliciting to be admitted into alliance, promising, that if they were defended from the arms of the Samnites, they would continue in fidelity and obedience under the government of the Roman people. Ambassadors were then sent by the Senate, and the Samnites were directed to withhold all violence from the territories of those states. And this embassy proved effectual not so much because the Samnites were desirous of peace, as because they were not prepared for war. The same year a war broke out with the people of Provernum, in which the people of Fundi were their supporters, their leader also being a Fundanian, Vitruvius Vaccus, a man of distinction not only at home, but in Rome also. He had a house on the Palatine Hill, which, after the building was raised and the ground thrown open, was called the Vaxipreta. Lucius Papirius having set out to oppose him whilst devastating extensively the districts of Sicia, Morba, and Cora, posted himself at no great distance from his camp. Vitruvius neither adopted the prudent resolution to enclose himself with his trenches against an enemy his superior in strength, nor had he sufficient courage to engage at any great distance from his camp. When his army had scarcely got out of the gate of the camp, and his soldiers were looking backwards to flight rather than to battle or the enemy, he enters on an engagement without judgment or boldness. And as he was conquered by a very slight effort and unequivocally, so did he by the very shortness of the distance, and by the facility of his retreat into the camp so near at hand, protect his soldiers without difficulty from much loss. And scarcely were any slain in the engagement itself, and but few in the confusion of the flight in the rear, whilst they were making their way into the camp. And as soon as it was dark they repaired to Pravernum in trepidation, so that they might protect themselves rather by walls than by a rampart. Plautius, the other consul, after laying waste the lands in every direction and driving off the spoil, leads his army into the Fundanian territory. The senate of the Fundanians met him as he was entering their borders. 
they declare that, they had not come to intercede in behalf of Vitruvius or those who followed his faction, but in behalf of the people of Fundi, whose exemption from any blame in the war had been proved by Vitruvius himself. When he made Pravernum his place of retreat, and not his native country, Fundi. At Pravernum, therefore, the enemies of the Roman people were to be looked for, and punished, who revolted at the same time from the Fundanians and the Romans, unmindful of both countries. That the Fundanians were at peace, that they had Roman feelings and a grateful recollection of the political rights received. They entreated the consul to withhold war from an inoffensive people. Their lands, city, their own bodies and those of their wives and children, were, and ever should be, at the disposal of the Roman people. The consul, having commended the Fundanians, and dispatched letters to Rome that the Fundanians had preserved their allegiance, turned his march to Pravernum. Claudius states, that the consul first punished those who were at the head of the conspiracy, that 350 of the conspirators were sent in chains to Rome. And that such submission was not received by the Senate, because they considered that the people of Fundi wished to come off with impunity by the punishment of needy and humble persons. While the siege of Pravernum was being conducted by the two consular armies, one of the consuls was recalled to Rome, on account of the elections. This year jails were first erected in the circus. While the attention of the public was still occupied by the Privernian War, an alarming report of the Gauls being in arms, a matter scarcely ever slighted by the Senate, suddenly came on them. The new consuls, therefore, Lucius Emilius Mamersinus and Caius Plautius, on the calends of July, the very day on which they entered into office, received orders to settle the provinces immediately between themselves. And Mamersinus, to whom the Gallic War fell, was directed to levy troops, without admitting any plea of immunity, nay, it is said, that even the rabble of handicrafts, and those of sedentary trades, of all the worst qualified for military service, were called out. And a vast army was collected at Vi, in readiness to meet the Gauls. It was thought proper not to proceed to a greater distance, lest the enemy might by some other route arrive at the city without being observed. In the course of a few days it being ascertained, on a careful inquiry, that everything on that side was quiet at the time, the whole force, which was to have opposed the Gauls, was then turned against Pravernum. Of the issue of the business, there are two different accounts, some say, that the city was taken by storm. And that Vitruvius fell alive into the hands, of the conquerors, others maintain that the townsmen, to avoid the extremities of a storm, presenting the rod of peace, surrendered to the consul, and that Vitruvius was delivered up by his troops. The Senate, being consulted with respect to Vitruvius and the Pravernians, sent directions, that the consul Plautius should demolish the walls of Pravernum, and, leaving a strong garrison there, come home to enjoy the honour of a triumph. At the same time ordering that Vitruvius should be kept in prison, until the return of the consul, and that he should then be beaten with rods, and put to death. His house, which stood on the Palatine Hill, they commanded to be razed to the ground, and his effects to be devoted to Semo Sancus. With the money produced by the sale of them, brazen globes were formed, and placed in the chapel of Sancus, opposite to the temple of Quirinus. As to the Senate of Pravernum, it was decreed, that every person who had continued to act as a senator of Pravernum, after the revolt from the Romans, should reside on the farther side of the Tiber, under the same restrictions as those of Velatri. After the passing of these decrees, there was no further mention of the Pravernians, until Plautius had triumphed. After the triumph, Vitruvius, with his accomplices, having been put to death, the consul thought that all being now fully gratified by the sufferings of the guilty, allusion might be safely made to the business of the Pravernians. He spoke in the following manner, Conscript fathers, since the authors of the revolt have received, both from the immortal gods and from you, the punishment so well merited. What do ye judge proper to be done with respect to the guiltless multitude? For my part, although my duty consists rather in collecting the opinions of others than in offering my own, yet, when I reflect that the Pravernians are situated in the neighborhood of the Samnites, our peace with whom is exceedingly uncertain. I should wish, that as little ground of animosity as possible may be left between them and us. The affair naturally admitted of a diversity of opinions, each, agreeably to his particular temper, recommending either severity or lenity. 
matters were still further perplexed by one of the Privernian ambassadors, more mindful of the prospects to which he had been born, than to the exigency of the present juncture, who being asked by one of the advocates for severity. What punishment he thought the Privernians deserved? Answered, such as those deserve who deem themselves worthy of liberty. The consul observing, that, by this stubborn answer, those who were adverse to the cause of the Privernians were the more exasperated against them, and wishing, by a question of favorable import, to draw from him a more conciliating reply. Said to him, What if we remit the punishment, in what manner may we expect that ye will observe the peace which shall be established between us? He replied, If the peace which ye grant us be a good one, both inviolable and eternal, if bad, of no long continuance. Then indeed some exclaimed, that the Privernian menaced them, and not in ambiguous terms. And that by such expressions peaceable states were incited to rebellion. But the more reasonable part of the Senate interpreted his answers more favorably, and said, that, the words they had heard were those of a man, and of a free man. Could it be believed that any people, or even any individual, would remain, longer than necessity constrained, in a situation which he felt painful? That peace was faithfully observed, only when those at peace were voluntarily so. But that fidelity was not to be expected where they wished to establish slavery. In this opinion they were led to concur, principally, by the consul himself, who frequently observed to the consulars, who had proposed the different resolutions, in such a manner as to be heard by several. That, surely those men only who thought of nothing but liberty, were worthy of being made Romans. They consequently both carried their cause in the Senate, and, moreover, by direction of that body, a proposal was laid before the people, that the freedom of the state should be granted to the Privernians. The same year a colony of three hundred was sent to Anxer, and received two acres of land each. The year following, in which the consuls were Publius Plautius Proculus and Publius Cornelius Scapula, was remarkable for no one transaction, civil or military, except the sending of a colony to Fregelli, a district which had belonged to the Citizenians, and afterwards to the Volscians. And a distribution of meat to the people, made by Marcus Flavius, on occasion of the funeral of his mother. There were many who represented, that, under the appearance of doing honor to his parent, a deserved recompense was made to the people, for having acquitted him, when prosecuted by the Aediles on a charge of having debauched a married woman. This distribution of meat intended as a return for favors shown on the trial, proved also the means of procuring him the honor of a public office. For, at the next election, though absent, he was preferred before the candidates who solicited in person the tribuneship of the commons. The city of Palaeopolis was situated at no great distance from the spot where Nepolis now stands. The two cities were inhabited by one people, these came from Cumi, and the Cumans derived their origin from Chalcis in Euboea. By means of the fleet in which they had been conveyed hither, they possessed great power on the coast of the sea, near which they dwelt. Having first landed on the islands of Inaria, and the Pithecusi, they afterwards ventured to transfer their settlement to the continent. This state, relying both on their own strength, as well as on the treacherous nature of the alliance of the Samnites with the Romans. Or, encouraged by the report of a pestilence having attacked the city of Rome, committed various acts of hostility against the Romans settled in the Campanian and Falernian territories. Wherefore, in the succeeding consulate of Lucius Cornelius, and Quintus Publilius Philo a second time, heralds being sent to Palaeopolis to demand satisfaction, when a haughty answer was returned by these Greeks. A race more magnanimous in words than in action, the people, in pursuance of the direction of the Senate, ordered war to be declared against the Palapolitans. On settling the provinces between the consuls, the war against the Greeks fell to Publilius. Cornelius, with another army, was appointed to watch the Samnites if they should attempt any movement. But a report prevailed that they, anxiously expecting a revolt in Campania, intended to march their troops thither, that was judged by Cornelius the proper station for him. The Senate received information, from both the consuls, that there was very little hope of peace with the Samnites. Publilius informed them, that two thousand soldiers from Noli, and four thousand of the Samnites, 
had been received into Palaeopolis, a measure rather forced on the Greeks by the Nolans than agreeable to their inclination. Cornelius wrote, that a levy of troops had been ordered, that all Samnium was in motion, and that the neighboring states of Provernum, Fundi, and Formii, were openly solicited to join them. When in consequence it was thought proper, that, before hostilities were commenced, ambassadors should be sent to the Samnites, an insolent answer is returned by them. They even went so far as to accuse the Romans of behaving injuriously towards them. But, nevertheless, they took pains to clear themselves of the charges made against them, asserting, that, the Greeks were not assisted with either counsel or aid by their state, nor were the Fundanians or Formians tampered with by them. For, if they were disposed to war, they had not the least reason to be diffident of their own strength. However, they could not dissemble, that it gave great offence to the state of the Samnites, that Fragelli, by them taken from the Volscians and demolished, should have been rebuilt by the Romans. And that they should have established a colony within the territory of the Samnites, to which their colonists gave the name of Fragelli. This injury and affront, if not done away by the authors, they were determined themselves to remove, by every means in their power. When one of the Roman ambassadors proposed to discuss the matter before their common allies and friends, their magistrate said, Why do we disguise our sentiments? Romans, no conferences of ambassadors, nor arbitration of any person whatever, can terminate our differences, but the plains of Campania, in which we must meet, our arms and the common fortune of war will settle the point. Let our armies, therefore, meet between Capua and Suesula, and there let us decide, whether the Samnite or the Roman shall hold the sovereignty of Italy. To this the ambassadors of the Romans replied, that they would go, not whither their enemy called, but whither their commanders should lead. In the meantime, Publilius, by seizing an advantageous post between Palaeopolis and Nepolis, had cut off that interchange of mutual aid, which they had hitherto afforded each other, according as either place was hard-pressed. Accordingly, when both the day of the elections approached, and as it was highly inexpedient for the public interest that Publilius should be called away when on the point of assailing the enemy's walls. And in daily expectation of gaining possession of their city, application was made to the tribunes, to recommend to the people the passing of an order, that Publilius Philo, when his year of office should expire, might continue in command. As proconsul, until the war with the Greeks should be finished. A letter was dispatched to Lucius Cornelius, with orders to name a dictator, for it was not thought proper that the consul should be recalled from the vigorous prosecution of the war now that he had entered into Samnium. He nominated Marcus Claudius Marcellus, who appointed Spurius Postumius master of the horse. The elections, however, were not held by the dictator, because it became a question whether he had been appointed under an irregularity. And the augurs being consulted, pronounced that it appeared that the dictator's appointment was defective. The tribunes invade against this proceeding as dangerous and dishonorable. For it was not probable, they said, that such defect could have been discovered, as the consul, rising in the night, had nominated the dictator while everything was still. Nor had the said consul in any of his letters, either public or private, made any mention of such a thing to any one, nor did any person whatever come forward who said that he saw or heard anything which could vitiate the auspices. Neither could the augurs sitting at Rome divine what inauspicious circumstance had occurred to the consul in the camp. Who did not plainly perceive, that the dictator's being a plebeian, was the defect which the augurs had discovered. These and other arguments were urged in vain by the tribunes, the affair however ended in an interregnum. At last, after the elections had been adjourned repeatedly on one pretext or another, the fourteenth in Turex, Lucius Emilius, elected consuls Caius Paetilius, and Lucius Papirius Mugilanus, or Cursor, as I find him named in some annals. It has been recorded, that in this year Alexandria in Egypt was founded, and that Alexander, king of Epirus, being slain by a Lucanian exile, verified in the circumstances of his death the prediction of Jupiter of Dodona. At the time when he was invited into Italy by the Tarentines, a caution had been given him, to beware of the Acherusian waters and the city Pandosia, for there were fixed the limits of his destiny. For that reason he made the greater haste to pass over to Italy, in order to be at as great a distance as possible from the city Pandosia in Epirus, and the river Acheron, 
which, after flowing through Molossus, runs into the lakes called Infernal, and is received into the Thesprotian Gulf. But, as it frequently happens, that men, by endeavouring to shun their fate, run directly upon it, after having often defeated the armies of Brutium and Lucania, and taken Heraclea, a colony of the Tarentines. Consentia and Metapontum from the Lucanians, Tarina from the Brutians, and several other cities of the Messapians and Lucanians. And having sent into Epirus three hundred illustrious families, whom he intended to keep as hostages, he posted his troops on three hills, which stood at a small distance from each other, not far from the city Pandosia. And close to the frontiers of the Brutians and Lucanians, in order that he might thence make incursions into every part of the enemy's country. At that time he kept about his person two hundred Lucanian exiles, as faithful attendants, but whose fidelity, according to the general disposition of people of that description, was ever ready to follow the changes of fortune. When continual rains spread such an inundation over all the plains, as cut off from the three separate divisions of the army all means of mutual aid, the two parties, in neither of which the king was present, were suddenly attacked and overpowered by the enemy, who, after putting them to the sword, employed their whole force in blockading the king himself. From this place the Lucanian exiles sent emissaries to their countrymen, and stipulating a safe return for themselves, promised to deliver the king, either alive or dead, into their power. But he, bravely resolving to make an extraordinary effort, at the head of a chosen band, broke through the midst of their forces. Engaged singly, and slew the general of the Lucanians, and collecting together his men, who had been scattered in the retreat arrived at a river which pointed out his road by the ruins of a bridge which had been recently broken by the violence of the flood. Here, while the party was fording the river on a very uneven bottom, a soldier, almost spent with fatigue and apprehension, cried out as a reflection on the odious name of it. You are justly named Acros, dismal, which expression reaching the king's ears, and instantly recalling to his mind the fate denounced on him, he halted, hesitating whether he should cross over or not. Then Sodomus, one of the royal band of youths which attended him, asking why he delayed in such a critical moment, showed him that the Lucanians were watching an opportunity to perpetrate some act of treachery, whereupon the king, looking back, and seeing them coming towards him in a body, drew his sword, and pushed on his horse through the middle of the river. When he had now reached the shallow, a Lucanian exile from a distance transfixed him with a javelin, after his fall, the current carried down his lifeless body, with the weapon sticking in it. To the posts of the enemy, there a shocking mangling of it took place. For dividing it in the middle, they sent one half to Consentia, and kept the other, as a subject of mockery, to themselves. While they were throwing darts and stones at it, a woman mixing with the crowd, who were enraged to a degree beyond the credible extent of human resentment, prevailed on them to stop for a moment. She then told them with tears in her eyes that she had a husband and children, prisoners among the enemy, and that she hoped to be able with the king's body, however disfigured, to ransom her friends, this put an end to their outrages. The remnants of his limbs were buried at Consentia, entirely through the care of the woman, and his bones were sent to Metapontum to the enemy, from whence they were conveyed to Epirus to his wife Cleopatra and his sister Olympias. The latter of whom was the mother, the former the sister, of Alexander the Great. Such was the melancholy end of Alexander of Epirus. Of which, although fortune did not allow him to engage in hostilities with the Romans, yet, as he waged war in Italy, I have thought it proper to give this brief account. This year, the fifth time since the building of the city, the Lectisternium was performed at Rome for procuring the favour of the same deities to whom it was addressed before. When the new consuls had, by order of the people, sent persons to declare war against the Samnites, and they themselves were making all preparations with greater energy than against the Greeks. A new accession of strength also came to them when expecting no such thing. The Lucanians and Apulians, nations who, until that time, had no kind of intercourse with the Roman people, proposed an alliance with them, promising a supply of men and arms for the war, a treaty of friendship was accordingly concluded. At the same time, their affairs went on successfully in Samnium. Three towns fell into their hands, Aliphae, Caliphae, and Ruffrium, 
and the adjoining country to a great extent was, on the first arrival of the consuls, laid entirely waste. Whilst the war on this side was commenced with so much success, so the war in the other quarter where the Greeks were held besieged, now drew towards a conclusion. For, besides the communication between the two posts of the enemy being cut off, by the besiegers having possession of part of the works through which it had been carried on. They now suffered within the walls hardships far more grievous than those with which the enemy threatened them, and as if made prisoners by their own garrison. They were now subjected to the greatest indignities in the persons of their wives and children, and to such extremities as are generally felt on the sacking of cities. When, therefore, intelligence arrived that reinforcements were to come from Tarentum and from the Samnites, all agreed that there were more of the latter already within the walls than they wished. But the young men of Tarentum, who were Greeks as well as themselves, they earnestly longed for, as they hoped to be enabled by their means to oppose the Samnites and Nolans, no less than to resist their Roman enemies. At last a surrender to the Romans appeared to be the lightest evil. Sherelaus and Nymphius, the two principal men in the state, consulting together on the subject, settled the part which each was to act. It was that one should desert to the Roman general, and the other stay behind to manage affairs in the city, so as to facilitate the execution of their plan. Sherelaus was the person who came to Publilius Philo. He told him that he had taken a resolution, which he hoped would prove advantageous, fortunate, and happy to the Palapolitans and to the Roman people, of delivering the fortifications into his hands. Whether he should appear by that deed to have betrayed or preserved his country, depended on the honor of the Romans. That for himself in particular, he neither stipulated nor requested anything. But, in behalf of the state, he requested rather than stipulated, that in case the design should succeed, the Roman people would consider more especially the zeal and hazard with which it sought a renewal of their friendship. Then its folly and rashness in deviating from its duty. He was commended by the general, and received a body of three thousand soldiers, with which he was to seize on that part of the city which was possessed by the Samnites, this detachment was commanded by Lucius Quinctius, military tribune. At the same time also, Nymphius, on his part, artfully addressing himself to the commander of the Samnites, prevailed upon him, as all the troops of the Romans were employed either about Palaeopolis or in Samnium. To allow him to sail round with the fleet to the territory of Rome, where he undertook to ravage, not only the sea coast, but the country adjoining the very city. But, in order to avoid observation, it was necessary, he told him, to set out by night, and to launch the ships immediately. That this might be effected with the greater dispatch, all the young Samnites, except the necessary guards of the city, were sent to the shore. While Nymphius wasted the time there, giving contradictory orders, designedly, to create confusion, which was increased by the darkness, and by the crowd, which was so numerous as to obstruct each other's operations, Sherelaus, according to the plan concerted, was admitted by his associates into the city. And have filled the higher parts of it with Roman soldiers, he ordered them to raise a shout, on which the Greeks, who had received previous directions from their leaders, kept themselves quiet. The Nolans fled through the opposite part of the town, by the road leading to Nola. The flight of the Samnites, who were shut out from the city, was easier, but had a more disgraceful appearance. For they returned to their homes without arms, stripped, and destitute of everything, all, in short, belonging to them being left with their enemies, so that they were objects of ridicule, not only to foreigners, but even to their own countrymen. I know that there is another account of this matter, according to which the town is represented to have been betrayed by the Samnites, but I have this account on the authority most worthy of credit. Besides, the Treaty of Nepolis, for to that place the seat of government of the Greeks was then transferred, renders it more probable that the renewal of friendship was voluntary on their side. A triumph was decreed to Publilius, because people were well convinced that the enemy, reduced by the siege, had adopted terms of submission. These two extraordinary incidents, which never before occurred in any case, befell this man, a prolongation of command never before granted to any one, and a triumph after the expiration of his office. Another war soon after arose with the Greeks of the other coast. For the Tarentines having, for a considerable time, 
buoyed up the state of Palaeopolis with delusive hopes of assistance, when they understood that the Romans had gotten possession of that city. As if they were the persons who had suffered the disappointment, and not the authors of it, they invade against the Palapolitans, and became furious in their anger and malice towards the Romans. On this account also, because information was brought that the Lucanians and Apulians had submitted to the Roman people, for a treaty of alliance had been this year concluded with both these nations. The business, they observed, was now brought almost to their doors. And that the matter would soon come to this, that the Romans must either be dealt with as enemies, or received as masters, that, in fact, their interests were involved in the war of the Samnites, and in its issue. That that was the only nation which continued to make opposition. And that with power very inadequate, since the Lucanians left them, these however might yet be brought back, and induced to renounce the Roman alliance, if proper skill were used in sowing dissension between them. These reasonings being readily adopted, by people who wished for a change, some young Lucanians of considerable note among their countrymen, but devoid of honour, were procured for money. These having lacerated each other's persons with stripes, after they had come naked into a public meeting of their countrymen, exclaimed that, because they had ventured to go into the Roman camp, they had been thus beaten with rods. By order of the consul, and had hardly escaped the loss of their heads. A circumstance, so shocking in its nature, carrying strong proofs of the ill-treatment, none of artifice, the people were so irritated, that, by their clamours, they compelled the magistrates to call together the senate. And some standing round that assembly, insisted on a declaration of war against the Romans, others ran different ways to rouse to arms the multitude residing in the country. Thus the tumult hurrying into imprudence the minds even of rational men, a decree was passed, that the alliance with the Samnites should be renewed, and ambassadors sent for that purpose. Because this so sudden a proceeding was totally devoid of any obvious cause for its adoption, and consequently was little relied on for its sincerity. They were, however, obliged both to give hostages, and also to receive garrisons into their fortified places, and they, blinded by fraud and resentment, refused no terms. In a little time after, on the authors of the false charges removing to Tarentum, the whole imposition came to light. But as they had given all power out of their own hands, nothing was left them but unavailing repentance. This year there arose, as it were, a new era of liberty to the Roman commons, in this that a stop was put to the practice of confining debtors. This alteration of the law was effected in consequence of the lust and signal cruelty of one usurer. His name was Lucius Papirius. To him one Caius Publilius having surrendered his person to be confined for a debt due by his father, his youth and beauty, which ought to have excited commiseration, operated on the other's mind as incentives to lust and insult. He first attempted to seduce the young man by impure discourses, considering the bloom of his youth his own adventitious gain. But finding that his ears were shocked at their infamous tendency, he then endeavoured to terrify him by threats, and reminded him frequently of his situation. At last, convinced of his resolution to act conformably to his honourable birth, rather than to his present condition, he ordered him to be stripped and scourged. When with the marks of the rods imprinted in his flesh the youth rushed out into the public street, loudly complaining of the depravedness and inhumanity of the usurer. A vast number of people, moved by compassion for his early age, and indignation at his barbarous treatment, reflecting at the same time on their own lot and that of their children, flocked together into the forum. And from thence in a body to the Senate House. When the consuls were obliged by the sudden tumult to call a meeting of the Senate, the people, falling at the feet of each of the senators, as they were going into the Senate House, presented to their view the lacerated back of the youth. On that day, in consequence of the outrageous conduct of an individual, the strongest bonds of credit were broken. And the consuls were commanded to propose to the people, that no person should be held in fetters or stocks, except convicted of a crime, and in order to punishment. But that, for money due, the goods of the debtor, not his person, should be answerable. Thus the confined debtors were released, and provision made, for the time to come, that they should not be liable to confinement. In the course of this year, while the war with the Samnites was sufficient in itself to give full employment to the Senate, 
besides the sudden defection of the Lucanians, and the Tarentines, the promoters of the defection. Another source of uneasiness, was added in a union formed by the state of the Vestinians with the Samnites. Which event, though it continued, during the present year, to be the general subject of conversation, without coming under any public discussion, appeared so important to the consuls of the year following, Lucius Furius Camillus a second time. And Junius Brutus Sceva, that it was the first business which they proposed to the consideration of the state. And though the matter was still recent, still great perplexity seized the Senate, as they dreaded equally the consequences either of passing it over, or of taking it up. Lest, on the one hand, impunity might stir up the neighboring states with wantonness and arrogance. And, on the other, punishment inflicted on them by force of arms, and dread of immediate danger, might produce the same effect by exciting resentment. And the whole body, too, was in every way equal in strength to the Samnites, being composed of the Marsians, the Polygnians, and the Marazinians, all of whom would have to be encountered as enemies, if the Vestinians were to be interfered with. However, that side prevailed which might, at the time, seem to have more spirit than prudence, but the event proved that fortune assists the brave. The people, in pursuance of the direction of the Senate, ordered war against the Vestinians. That province fell by lot to Junius, Samnium to Camillus. Armies were led to both places, and by carefully guarding the frontiers, the enemy were prevented from joining their forces. But the other consul, Lucius Furius, on whom the principal weight of the business rested, was withdrawn by chance from the war, being seized with a severe sickness. Being therefore ordered to nominate a dictator to conduct the business, he nominated Lucius Papirius Cursor, the most celebrated general, by far, of any in that age who appointed Quintus Fabius Maximus Rullianus master of the horse, a pair of commanders distinguished for their exploits in war. More so, however, for a quarrel between themselves, and which proceeded almost to violence. The other consul, in the territory of the Vestinians, carried on operations of various kinds, and, in all, was uniformly successful. For he both utterly laid waste their lands, and, by spoiling and burning their houses and corn, compelled them to come to an engagement. And, in one battle, he reduced the strength of the Vestinians to such a degree, though not without loss on his own side, that the enemy not only fled to their camp, but, fearing even to trust to the rampart and trench. Dispersed from thence into the several towns, in hopes of finding security in the situation and fortifications of their cities. At last, having undertaken to reduce their towns by force, amid the great ardor of the soldiers, and their resentment for the wounds which they had received, hardly one of them having come out of the battle unhurt, he took Cutina by Scalade. And afterwards Singilia. The spoil of both cities he gave to the soldiers, in consideration of their having bravely surmounted the obstruction both of gates and walls. The commanders entered Samnium under uncertain auspices. An informality which pointed, not at the event of war, for that was prosperous, but at the furious passions and the quarrels which broke out between the leaders. For Papirius the dictator, returning to Rome in order to take the auspices anew, in consequence of a caution received from the Aruspex, left strict orders with the master of the horse to remain in his post. And not to engage in battle during his absence. After the departure of the dictator, Fabius having discovered by his scouts that the enemy were in as unguarded a state as if there was not a single Roman in Samnium, the high-spirited youth. Either conceiving indignation at the sole authority in every point appearing to be lodged in the hands of the dictator, or induced by the opportunity of striking an important blow, having made the necessary preparations and dispositions. Marched to a place called Umbrinium, and there fought a battle with the Samnites. His success in the fight was such, that there was no one circumstance which could have been improved to more advantage, if the dictator had been present. The leader was not wanting to the soldiers, nor the soldiers to their leader. The cavalry too, finding, after repeated charges, that they could not break the ranks, by the advice of Lucius Cominius, a military tribune, pulled off the bridles from their horses and spurred them on so furiously, that no power could withstand them. Forcing their way through the thickest of the enemy, they bore down everything before them, and the infantry seconding the charge, the whole body was thrown into confusion. 
20,000 of the enemy are said to have fallen on that day. I have authority for saying that there were two battles fought during the dictator's absence, and two victories obtained, but, according to the most ancient writers, only this one is found, and in some histories the whole transaction is omitted. The master of the horse getting possession of abundance of spoils, in consequence of the great number slain, collected the arms into a huge heap, and burned them. Either in pursuance of a vow to some of the gods, or, if we choose to credit the authority of Fabius, it was done on this account, that the dictator might not reap the fruits of his glory, inscribe his name on them, or carry the spoils in triumph. His letters also, containing an account of the success, being sent to the senate, not to the dictator, showed plainly that he wished not to impart to him any share of the honour. Who certainly viewed the proceeding in this light, for while others rejoiced at the victory obtained, he showed only surliness and anger. Insomuch that, immediately dismissing the senate, he hastened out of the senate house, and frequently repeated with warmth, that the legions of the Samnites were not more effectually vanquished and overthrown by the master of the horse. Then were the dictatorial dignity and military discipline, if such contempt of orders escaped with impunity. Thus, breathing resentment and menaces, he set out for the camp, but, though he travelled with all possible expedition, he was unable, however, to outstrip the report of his coming. For messengers had started from the city before him, who brought intelligence that the dictator was coming, eager for vengeance, and in almost every second sentence applauding the conduct of Titus Manlius. Fabius instantly called an assembly, and entreated the soldiers to show the same courage in protecting him, under whose conduct and auspices they had conquered, from the outrageous cruelty of the dictator. Which they had so lately displayed in defending the commonwealth from its most inveterate enemies. He was now coming, he told them, frantic with envy, enraged at another's bravery and success, he was mad, because, in his absence, the business of the public had been executed, with remarkable success. And if he could change the fortune of the engagement, would wish the Samnites in possession of victory rather than the Romans. He talked much of contempt of orders. As if his prohibition of fighting were not dictated by the same motive, which caused his vexation at the fight having taken place. He wished to shackle the valor of others through envy, and meant to take away the soldiers' arms when they were most eager for action, and that no use might be made of them in his absence, he was further enraged too. Because without Lucius Papirius the soldiers were not without hands or arms, and because Quintus Fabius considered himself as master of the horse, not as a beetle to the dictator. How would he have behaved, had the issue of the fight been unfortunate, which, through the chances of war and the uncertainty of military operations, might have been the case. Since now, when the enemy has been vanquished, as completely, indeed, as if that leader's own singular talents had been employed in the matter, he yet threatens the master of the horse with punishment. Nor is he more incensed against the master of the horse, than against the military tribunes, the centurions, and the soldiers. On all, he would vent his rage if he could, and because that is not in his power, he vents it on one. Envy, like flame, soars upwards, aims at the summit, that he makes his attack on the head of the business, on the leader. If he could put him out of the way, together with the glory of the service performed, he would then lord it, like a conqueror over vanquished troops. And, without scruple, practice against the soldiers what he had been allowed to act against their commander. That they should, therefore, in his cause, support the general liberty of all. If the dictator perceived among the troops the same unanimity in justifying their victory that they had displayed in the battle, and that all interested themselves in the safety of one, it would bend his temper to milder counsels. In fine, he told them, that he committed his life, and all his interests, to their honour and to their courage. His speech was received with the loudest acclamations from every part of the assembly, bidding him, have courage. For while the Roman legions were in being, no man should offer him violence. Not long after, the dictator arrived, and instantly summoned an assembly by sound of trumpet. Then silence being made, a crier cited Quintus Fabius, master of the horse, and as soon as, on the lower ground, he had approached the tribunal, the dictator said, Quintus Fabius, I demand of you. When the authority of dictator is acknowledged to be supreme, and is submitted to by the consuls, 
officers endowed with regal power. And likewise by the praetors, created under the same auspices with consuls, whether or no you think it reasonable that it should not meet obedience from a master of the horse. I also ask you whether, when I knew that I set out from home under uncertain auspices, the safety of the commonwealth ought to have been endangered by me, whilst the omens were confused, or whether the auspices ought to be newly taken. So that nothing might be done while the will of the gods remained doubtful. And further, when a religious scruple was of such a nature as to hinder the dictator from acting, whether the master of the horse could be exempt from it and at liberty? But why do I ask these questions, when, though I had gone without leaving any orders, your own judgment ought to have been regulated according to what you could discover of my intention? Why do you not answer? Did I not forbid you to act, in any respect, during my absence? Did I not forbid you to engage the enemy? Yet, in contempt of these my orders, while the auspices were uncertain, while the omens were confused, contrary to the practice of war, contrary to the discipline of our ancestors, and contrary to the authority of the gods. You dared to enter on the fight. Answer to these questions proposed to you. On any other matter utter not a word. Lictor, draw near him. To each of these particulars, Fabius, finding it no easy matter to answer, at one time remonstrated against the same person acting as accuser and judge, in a cause which affected his very existence. At another, he asserted that his life should sooner be forced from him, than the glory of his past services, clearing himself and accusing the other by turns. So then Papirius anger blazing out with fresh fury, he ordered the master of the horse to be stripped, and the rods and axes to be got ready. Fabius, imploring the protection of the soldiers, while the lictors were tearing his garments, betook himself to the quarters of the veterans, who were already raising a commotion in the assembly, from them the uproar spread through the whole body. In one place the voice of supplication was heard, in another, menaces. Those who happened to stand nearest to the tribunal, because, being under the eyes of the general, they could easily be known, entreated him to spare the master of the horse, and not in him to condemn the whole army. The remoter parts of the assembly, and the crowd collected round Fabius, railed at the unrelenting spirit of the dictator, and were not far from mutiny, nor was even the tribunal perfectly quiet. The lieutenant's general standing round the general's seat besought him to adjourn the business to the next day, and to allow time to his anger, and room for consideration, representing that the indiscretion of Fabius had been sufficiently rebuked. His victory sufficiently disgraced, and they begged him not to proceed to the extreme of severity. Not to brand with ignominy a youth of extraordinary merit, or his father, a man of most illustrious character, together with the whole family of the Fabii. When they made but little impression either by their prayers or arguments, they desired him to observe the violent ferment of the assembly, and told him that, while the soldiers' tempers were heated to such a degree, it became not either his age or his wisdom to kindle them into a flame, and afford matter for a mutiny that no one would lay the blame of such an event on Quintus Fabius, who only deprecated punishment. But on the dictator, if, blinded by resentment, he should, by an ill-judged contest, draw on himself the fury of the multitude, and lest he should think that they acted from motives of regard to Quintus Fabius, they were ready to make oath that. In their judgment it was not for the interest of the commonwealth that Quintus Fabius should be punished at that time. When by these expostulations they rather irritated the dictator against themselves, than appeased his anger against the master of the horse, the lieutenants general were ordered to go down from the tribunal. And after several vain attempts were made to procure silence by means of a crier, the noise and tumult being so great that neither the voice of the dictator himself, nor that of his apparitors, could be heard. Knight, as in the case of a battle, put an end to the contest. The master of the horse was ordered to attend on the day following. But when all assured him that Papirius, being agitated and exasperated in the course of the present contention, would proceed against him with greater violence, he fled privately from the camp to Rome. Where, by the advice of his father, Marcus Fabius, who had been three times consul, and likewise dictator, he immediately called a meeting of the Senate. While he was strenuously complaining before the fathers of the rage and injustice of the dictator, on a sudden was heard the noise of lictors before the senate house, clearing the way, and Papirius himself arrived, 
full of resentment. Having followed, with a guard of light horse, as soon as he heard that the other had quitted the camp. The contention then began anew, and the dictator ordered Fabius to be seized. Where, when his unrelenting spirit persisted in its purpose, notwithstanding the united intercessions of the principal patricians, and of the whole senate, Fabius, the father, then said. Since neither the authority of the senate has any weight with you, nor my age, which you wish to render childless, nor the noble birth and merit of a master of the horse, nominated by yourself, nor prayers which have often mitigated the rage of an enemy, and which appease the wrath of the gods. I call upon the tribunes of the commons for support, and appeal to the people. And since you decline the judgment of your own army, as well as of the senate, I call you before a judge who must certainly be allowed, though no other should, to possess more power and authority than yourself, though dictator. I shall see whether you will submit to an appeal, to which Tullus Hostilius, a Roman king, submitted. They proceeded directly from the senate house to the assembly. Where, being arrived, the dictator attended by few, the master of the horse by all the people of the first rank in a body, Papirius commanded him to be taken from the rostrum to the lower ground. His father, following him, said, You do well in ordering us to be brought down to a place where even as private persons we have liberty of speech. At first, instead of regular speeches, nothing but altercation was heard. At length, the indignation of old Fabius, and the strength of his voice, got the better of noise, while he reproached Papirius with arrogance and cruelty. He himself, he said, had been dictator at Rome. And no man, not even the lowest plebeian, or centurion, or soldier, had been outraged by him. But Papirius sought for victory and triumph over a Roman commander, as over the generals of the enemy. What an immense difference between the moderation of the ancients, and modern oppression and cruelty. Quinctius Cincinnatus when dictator exercised no further severity on Lucius Minucius the consul, although rescued by him from a siege, then leaving him at the head of the army, in the quality of lieutenant general, instead of consul. Marcus Furius Camillus, in the case of Lucius Furius, who, in contempt of his great age and authority, had fought a battle with a most disgraceful result. Not only restrained his anger at the time so as to write no unfavorable representation of his conduct to the people or the senate. But after returning home, when the patricians gave him a power of electing from among his colleagues whoever he might approve as an associate with himself in the command, chose that very man in preference to all the other consular tribunes. Nay, that not even the resentment of the people, with whom lay the supreme power in all cases, was ever exercised with greater severity towards those who, through rashness and ignorance, had occasioned the loss of armies. Then the finding them in a sum of money. Until that day, a capital prosecution for ill conduct in war had never been instituted against any commander, but now generals of the Roman people when victorious, and meriting the most honorable triumphs, are threatened with rods and axes. A treatment which would not have been deemed allowable, even towards those who had been defeated by an enemy. What would his son have to suffer, if he had occasioned the loss of the army? If he had been routed, put to flight, and driven out of his camp? To what greater length could his resentment and violence be stretched, than to scourge him, and put him to death? How was it consistent with reason, that through the means of Quintus Fabius, the state should be filled with joy, exulting in victory, and occupied in thanksgivings and congratulations? While at the same time, he who had given occasion to the temples of the gods being thrown open, their altars yet smoking with sacrifices, and loaded with honors and offerings, should be stripped naked and torn with stripes in the sight of the Roman people. Within view of the capital and citadel, and of those gods not in vain invoked in two different battles. With what temper would the army which had conquered under his conduct and auspices have borne it? What mourning would there be in the Roman camp? What joy among their enemies? This speech he accompanied with an abundant flow of tears, uniting reproaches and complaints, imploring the aid both of gods and men, and warmly embracing his son. On his side stood the majesty of the senate, the favor of the people, the support of the tribunes, and regard for the absent army. On the other side were urged the inviolable authority of the Roman government and military discipline. The edict of the dictator, 
always observed as the mandate of a deity, the orders of Manlius, and his postponing even parental affection to public utility. The same also, said the dictator, was the conduct of Lucius Brutus, the founder of Roman liberty, in the case of his two sons. That now fathers were become indulgent, and the aged indifferent in the case of the authority of others being despised, and indulged the young in the subversion of military order, as if it were a matter of trifling consequence. For his part, however, he would persevere in his purpose, and would not remit the smallest part of the punishment justly due to a person who fought contrary to his orders, while the rites of religion were imperfectly executed. And the auspice is uncertain. Whether the majesty of the supreme authority was to be perpetual or not, depended not on him, but Lucius Papirius would not diminish aught of its rights. He wished that the tribunician office, inviolate itself, would not by its interposition violate the authority of the Roman government. Nor the Roman people, to their own detriment particularly, annihilate the dictator and the rights of the dictatorship together. But if this should be the case, not Lucius Papirius but the tribunes and the people would be blamed by posterity in vain. When military discipline being once dissolved, the soldier would no longer obey the orders of the centurion, the centurion those of the tribune, the tribune those of the lieutenant general, the lieutenant general those of the consul, nor the master of the horse those of the dictator. No one would then pay any deference to men, no, nor even to the gods. Neither edicts of generals nor auspices would be observed. The soldiers, without leave of absence, would straggle at random through the lands of friends and of foes. And regardless of their oath would, influenced solely by a wanton humor, quit the service whenever they might choose. The standards would be unattended and forsaken, the men would neither assemble in pursuance of orders, nor would any distinction be made as to fighting by night or by day, on favorable or unfavorable ground. By order or without the orders of the general. Nor would they observe standards or ranks, the service, instead of being solemn and sacred, would be confused and the result of mere chance, like that of freebooters. Render yourselves then, tribunes of the commons, accountable for all these evils to all future ages. Expose your own persons to these heavy imputations in defense of the licentious conduct of Quintus Fabius. The tribunes now confounded, and more anxiously concerned at their own situation than at his for whom their support was sought, were freed from this embarrassment by the Roman people unanimously having recourse to prayers and entreaties. That the dictator would, for their sakes, remit the punishment of the master of the horse. The tribunes likewise, following the example set them of employing entreaties, earnestly beseech the dictator to pardon human error, to consider the immaturity of the offender's age, that he had suffered sufficiently. And now the youth himself, now his father, Marcus Fabius, disclaiming further contest, fell at the dictator's knees and deprecated his wrath. Then the dictator, after causing silence, said, Romans, it is well. Military discipline has prevailed. The majesty of government has prevailed, both which were in danger of ceasing this day to exist. Quintus Fabius, who fought contrary to the order of his commander, is not acquitted of guilt. But after being condemned as guilty, is granted as a boon to the Roman people, is granted to the College of Tribunes, supporting him with their prayers, not with the regular power of their office. Live, Quintus Fabius, more happy in this united sympathy of the state for your preservation, than in the victory in which you lately exulted. Live, after having ventured on such an act, as your father himself, had he been in the place of Lucius Papirius, would not have pardoned. With me you shall be reconciled whenever you wish it. To the Roman people, to whom you owe your life, you can perform no greater service than to let this day teach you a sufficient lesson to enable you to submit to lawful commands, both in war and peace. He then declared, that he no longer detained the master of the horse, and as he retired from the rostrum, the senate being greatly rejoiced, and the people still more so, gathered round him and escorted him, on one hand commending the dictator. On the other congratulating the master of the horse. While it was considered that the authority of military command was confirmed no less effectually by the danger of Quintus Fabius than the lamentable punishment of young Manlius. It so happened, that, through the course of that year, as often as the dictator left the army the Samnites were in motion, 
but Marcus Valerius, the lieutenant general who commanded in the camp, had Quintus Fabius before his eyes for an example. Not to fear any violence of the enemy, so much as the unrelenting anger of the dictator. So that when a body of his foragers fell into an ambuscade and were cut to pieces in disadvantageous ground, it was generally believed that the lieutenant general could have given them assistance if he had not been held in dread by his rigorous orders. The resentment for this also alienated the affections of the soldiery from the dictator, already incensed against him because he had been implacable towards Quintus Fabius. And because he had granted him pardon at the intercession of the Roman people, a thing which he had refused to their entreaties. The dictator, having appointed Lucius Papirius Crassus, as master of the horse, to the command of the city, and prohibited Quintus Fabius from acting in any case as magistrate, returned to the camp. Where his arrival brought neither any great joy to his countrymen, nor any degree of terror to the enemy, for on the day following, either not knowing that the dictator had arrived, or little regarding whether he were present or absent. They approached his camp in order of battle. Of such importance, however, was that single man, Lucius Papirius, that had the zeal of the soldiers seconded the dispositions of the commander, no doubt was entertained that an end might have been put that day to the war with the Samnites. So judiciously did he draw up his army with respect to situation and reserves, in such a manner did he strengthen them with every advantage of military skill, but the soldiers exerted no vigor. And designedly kept from conquering, in order to injure the reputation of their leader. Of the Samnites, however, very many were slain, and great numbers of the Romans wounded. The experienced commander quickly perceived the circumstance which prevented his success, and that it would be necessary to moderate his temper, and to mingle mildness with austerity. Accordingly, attended by the lieutenant's general, going round to the wounded soldiers, thrusting his head into their tents, and asking them, one by one, how they were in health. Then, mentioning them by name, he gave them in charge to the officers, tribunes, and prefects. This behavior, popular in itself, he maintained with such dexterity, that by his attention to their recovery he gradually gained their affection. Nor did anything so much contribute towards their recovery as the circumstance of this attention being received with gratitude. The army being restored to health, he came to an engagement with the enemy. And both himself and the troops, being possessed with full confidence of success, he so entirely defeated and dispersed the Samnites, that that was the last day they met the dictator in the field. The victorious army, afterwards, directed its march wherever a prospect of booty invited, and traversed the enemy's territories, encountering not a weapon, nor any opposition, either openly or by stratagem. It added to their alacrity, that the dictator had, by proclamation, given the whole spoil to the soldiers, so that they were animated not only by the public quarrel, but by their private emolument. Reduced by these losses, the Samnites sued to the dictator for peace, and, after they had engaged to supply each of his soldiers with a suit of clothes and a year's pay, being ordered to apply to the Senate, they answered. That they would follow the dictator, committing their cause wholly to his integrity and honor. On this the troops were withdrawn out of Samnium. The dictator entered the city in triumph. And, though desirous of resigning his office immediately, yet, by order of the Senate, he held it until the consuls were elected, these were Caius Sulpicius Longus a second time, and Quintus Emilius Serratanus. The Samnites, without finishing the treaty of peace, the terms being still in negotiation, brought home with them a truce for a year. Nor was even that faithfully observed. So strongly was their inclination for war excited, on hearing that Papirius was gone out of office. In this consulate of Caius Sulpicius and Quintus Emilius, some histories have Aulius, to the revolt of the Samnites was added a new war with the Apulians. Armies were sent against both. The Samnites fell by lot to Sulpicius, the Apulians to Emilius. Some writers say, that this war was not waged with the Apulians, but that the allied states of that nation were defended against the violence and injustice of the Samnites. But the circumstances of the Samnites, who could with difficulty, at that period, support a war in which themselves were engaged, render it more probable that they did not make war on the Apulians. But that both nations were in arms against the Romans at the same time. However, no memorable event occurred. 
The lands of the Apulians and of Samnium were utterly laid waste, but in neither quarter were the enemy to be found. At Rome, an alarm which happened in the night, suddenly roused the people from their sleep, in such a fright, that the capital and citadel, the walls and gates, were all filled with men in arms. But after they had called all to their posts, and run together in bodies, in every quarter, when day approached, neither the author nor cause of the alarm could be discovered. This year, in pursuance to the advice of Flavius, the Tusculans were brought to a trial before the people. Marcus Flavius, a tribune of the commons, proposed, that punishment should be inflicted on those of the Tusculans, by whose advice and assistance the Velaternians and Privernians had made war on the Roman people. The Tusculans, with their wives and children, came to Rome. The whole party in mourning habits, like persons under accusation, went round the tribes, throwing themselves at the feet of the citizens. The compassion thus excited operated more effectually towards procuring them pardon, than all their arguments did towards clearing them of guilt. Every one of the tribes, except the Polian, negative the proposition. The sentence of the Polian tribe was, that the grown-up males should be beaten and put to death, and their wives and children sold by auction, according to the rules of war. It appears that the resentment which rose against the advisers of so rigorous a measure, was retained in memory by the Tusculans down to the age of our fathers. And that hardly any candidate of the Polian tribe could, ever since, gain the votes of the Papirian. On the following year, in the consulate of Quintus Fabius and Lucius Fulvius, Aulus Cornelius Arvina being made dictator, and Marcus Fabius Ambustus master of the horse. A levy being held with more than usual rigor in consequence of their apprehension of a very serious war in Samnium, for it was reported that some young men had been hired from their neighbors, led forth a very strong army against the Samnites. Although in a hostile country, their camp was pitched in as careless a manner as if the foe were at a great distance. When, suddenly, the legions of the Samnites approached with so much boldness as to advance their rampart close to an outpost of the Romans. Night was now coming on, that prevented their assaulting the works. But they did not conceal their intention of doing so next day, as soon as the light should appear. The dictator found that there would be a necessity for fighting sooner than he had expected, and lest the situation should be an obstruction to the bravery of the troops, he led away the legions in silence leaving a great number of fires the better to deceive the enemy. On account of the proximity of the camps, however, he could not escape their observation, their cavalry instantly pursued, and pressed closely on his troops, in such a way as to refrain from attacking them until the day appeared. Their infantry did not even quit their camp before daylight. As soon as it was dawn, the cavalry venturing to attack the enemy by harassing the Roman rear, and pressing them in places of difficult passage, considerably delayed their march. Meanwhile their infantry overtook the cavalry, and now the Samnites pursued close with their entire force. The dictator then, finding that he could no longer go forward without great inconvenience, ordered the spot where he stood to be measured out for a camp. But it was impossible, while the enemy's horse were spread about on every side, that palisades could be brought, and the work be begun, seeing it, therefore, impracticable either to march forward or to settle himself there. He drew up his troops for battle, removing the baggage out of the line. The enemy likewise formed their line opposite to his, fully equal both in spirit and in strength. Their courage was chiefly improved from not knowing that the motive of the Romans' retreat was the incommodiousness of the ground, so that they imagined themselves objects of terror, and supposed that they were pursuing men who fled through fear. This kept the balance of the fight equal for a considerable time, though, of late, it had been unusual with the Samnites to stand even the shout of a Roman army. Certain it is, that the contest, on this day, continued so very doubtful from the third hour to the eighth, that neither was the shout repeated, after being raised at the first onset, nor the standards moved either forward or backward. Nor any ground lost on either side. They fought without taking breath or looking behind them, every man in his post, and pushing against their opponents with their shields. The noise continuing equal, and the terror of the fight the same, seemed to denote, that the decision would be effected either by fatigue or by the night. The men had now exhausted their strength, the sword its power, and the leaders their skill. 
when, on a sudden, the San Knight cavalry, having learned from a single troop which had advanced beyond the rest, that the baggage of the Romans lay at a distance from their army, without any guard or defense. Through eagerness for booty, they attack it, of which the dictator being informed by a hasty messenger, said, let them only encumber themselves with spoils. Afterwards came several, one after another, crying out, that they were plundering and carrying off all the effects of the soldiers, he then called to him the master of the horse, and said, Do you see, Marcus Fabius? That the fight has been forsaken by the enemy's cavalry? They are entangled and encumbered with our baggage. Attack them whilst scattered about, as is the case of every multitude employed in plundering, you will find few mounted on horseback, few with swords in their hands. And, while they are loading their horses with spoil, and unarmed, put them to the sword, and make it bloody spoil for them. I will take care of the legions, and the fight of the infantry, yours be the honor which the horse shall acquire. The body of cavalry, in the most exact order possible, charging the enemy, who were straggling and embarrassed, filled every place with slaughter, for amid the packages which they hastily threw down, and which lay in the way of their feet. And of the affrighted horses, as they endeavored to escape, being now unable either to fight or fly, they are slaughtered. Then Fabius, after he had almost entirely cut off the enemy's horse, led round his squadrons in a small circuit, and attacked the infantry in the rear. The new shout, raised in that quarter, terrified the Samnites on the one hand. And when, on the other, the dictator saw their troops in the van looking behind them, their battalions in confusion, and their line wavering, he earnestly exhorted and animated his men, calling on the tribunes and chief centurions, by name, to join him in renewing the fight. Raising the shout anew, they pressed forward, and as they advanced, perceived the enemy more and more confused. The cavalry now could be seen by those in front, and Cornelius, turning about to the several companies, made them understand, by raising his voice and hands, that he saw the standards and bucklers of his own horsemen. On hearing which, and at the same time seeing them, they, at once, so far forgot the fatigue which they had endured through almost the whole day, and even their wounds. That they rushed on against the enemy with as much vigor and alacrity as if they were coming fresh out of camp on receiving the signal for battle. The Samnites could no longer sustain the charge of horse and foot together, part of them, enclosed on both sides, were cut off, the rest were scattered and fled different ways. The infantry slew those who were surrounded and made resistance. And the cavalry made great havoc of the fugitives, among whom fell their general. This battle crushed, at length, the power of the Samnites so effectually, that, in all their meetings, they said, it was not at all to be wondered at, if in an impious war, commenced in violation of a treaty, when the gods were, with justice. More incensed against them than men, they succeeded in none of their undertakings. That war must be expiated and atoned for with a heavy penalty. The only alternative they had, was whether the penalty should be the guilty blood of a few, or the innocent blood of all. Some now ventured to name the authors of the war. One name in particular, by the united voices of all, was mentioned, that of Brutulus Papius, he was a man of power and noble birth, and undoubtedly the violator of the late truce. The praetors being compelled to take the opinion of the assembly concerning him, a decree was made, that Brutulus Papius should be delivered into the hands of the Romans. And that, together with him, all the spoil taken from the Romans, and the prisoners, should be sent to Rome, and that the restitution demanded by the heralds, in conformity to treaty, should be made, as was agreeable to justice and equity. In pursuance of this determination heralds were sent to Rome, and also the dead body of Brutulus, for, by a voluntary death, he avoided the punishment and ignominy intended for him. It was thought proper that his goods also should be delivered up along with the body. But none of all those things were accepted, except the prisoners, and such articles of the spoil as were recognized by the owners. The dictator obtained a triumph by a decree of the Senate. Some writers affirm, that this war was conducted by the consuls, and that they triumphed over the Samnites. And also, that Fabius advanced into Apulia, and carried off from thence abundance of spoil. But that Aulus Cornelius was dictator that year is an undisputed fact.
The question then is, whether he was appointed for the purpose of conducting the war, or on occasion of the illness of Lucius Plautius, the praetor. In order that there might be a magistrate to give the signal for the starting of the chariots at the Roman games. This latter is asserted of him. And that after performing the business, which in truth reflected no great luster on his office, he resigned the dictatorship. It is not easy to determine between either the facts or the writers, which of them deserves the preference, I am inclined to think that history has been much corrupted by means of funeral panegyrics and false inscriptions on statues. Each family striving by false representations to appropriate to itself the fame of warlike exploits and public honors. From this cause, certainly, both the actions of individuals and the public records of events have been confused. Nor is there extant any writer, contemporary with those events, on whose authority we can with certainty rely. End of Volume 1 John Childs and Son, Bungai Footnotes Employ myself to a useful purpose, facera opere precium, to do a thing that is worth the trouble, to employ oneself to a good purpose. See Scheller's Lat Lexicon. A practice, rem. Dot, some, as Baker, refer it to residential populi r. Others, as Strath, to residential pop rom prescriber. My share, pro virili part, or, to the best of my ability. Historians. Those mentioned by Livy himself are Q. Fabius Pictor, Valerius Antius, L. Piso, Q. Elius Tubero, C. Licinius Macer, Coelius, Polybius, etc. Hastening to these later times. The history of the recent civil wars would possess a more intense interest for the Romans of the Augustan age. From every care, the fear of giving offense by expressing his opinions freely, and the sorrow, which, as a patriot, he could not but feel in recording the civil wars of his countrymen. Acquired. This refers to the whole period antecedent to the time when A. P. Claudius carried the Roman arms beyond Italy against the Carthaginians, two, extended, from that time till the fall of Carthage, three, sinking, the times of the Gracchi. Four, gave way more and more, those of Sulla, five, precipitate, those of Caesar, six, the present times, those of Augustus after the Battle of Actium. Stalker. Aeneas, being now deified, could not be called by his human name. And in speaking of his being buried, it would be improper to name him by his divine title. Indigitum. He is called by Dionysius Chi Theta Nu Iota Omicron Theta Epsilon. Forte Quadum Divinitus. Theta Epsilon Tau Iota Nu Iota Tau Chi. Plot. Sil. The Palantian. By all his inquiries he arrived at the same conclusion as before, viz. That they were his grandchildren. According to Cato, Rome was founded on the day of the Palilia, the eleventh of the Calends of May, in the first year of the seventh Olympiad, and 751 BC. This is two years short of Varro's computation. He taught the Italians to read and write. Apparitors hoc genus. There is something incorrect in the language of the original here. In my version I have followed Drakenborch. Walker, in his edition, proposes to read ut for et. Thus, cabus ut apparitors e hoc genus of etrusus, numerum quoque ipsum ductum placet, who will have it, that as public servants of this kind, so was their number also, derived from the Etrurians. The population at that time consisted of not more than three thousand foot, and less than three hundred horse. At the death of Romulus, it is said to have amounted to forty-six thousand foot and almost one thousand horse. Tau mu epsilon tau alpha xi chi omega rho omicron nu tau omicron tau epsilon kappa alpha pi iota tau omega lambda omicron upsilon kappa alpha tau kappa rho alpha kappa alpha lambda epsilon tau alpha iota nu nu kappa alpha tau tau nu omega mu alpha omega nu delta iota lambda epsilon kappa tau omicron nu mu epsilon theta rho iota omicron nu delta upsilon omicron nu delta rho upsilon mu nu. Dio. 2. 15. Ex industria, data de opera. Pi pi alpha rho alpha sigma kappa epsilon upsilon. 2. 1 by A. Cornelius Cossus for slaying L. Tolumnius, king of Vi, U, C. 318. Another by M. Claudius Marcellus, for killing Viridomarus, 
King of the Gauls, U. C. 532. Nepotum et liberum progenium equals nepotes et liberos, iota epsilon chi alpha iota omega nu equals omicron chi alpha iota omicron iota. The original has undergone various changes here, my version coincides with the reading, loci circa densa obsida per gulta obscurus. Although, according to the terms of the alliance, the Sabines and the Romans were to be in all respects on an equal footing. The order of the people still requires the sanction of the Senate for its ratification, but that sanction now being given beforehand, the order of the people is no longer subject to the control of the Senate. And therefore not precarious as heretofore. Ex cabus loci's, quae fama in Sabinos, aut quo lingui commercio, quenquam exivisit. From which, remote, places, what high character of him, could have reached, to the Sabines, or by what intercourse of language could such high character of him have aroused any one to become a pupil? Other editions read qua fama. Thus, from which places by what high character for talent, or by what intercourse of language, could he, Pythagoras, have aroused any one, etc. Romulus had made his year to consist of ten months, the first month being March, and the number of days in the year being only 304, which corresponded neither with the course of the sun or moon. Numa, who added the two months of January and February, divided the year into twelve months, according to the course of the moon. This was the lunar Greek year, and consisted of 354 days. Numa, however, adopted 355 days for his year, from his partiality to odd numbers. The lunar year of 354 days fell short of the solar year by eleven and a quarter days, this in eight years amounted to, eleven and a quarter times eight, ninety days. These ninety days he divided into two months of twenty-two and two of twenty-three days, two by twenty-two, plus, two by twenty-three, equals ninety, and introduced them alternately every second year for two octennial periods, every third octennial period, however. Numa intercalated only sixty-six days instead of ninety days, I. E. He inserted three months of only twenty-two days each. The reason was, because he adopted three hundred and fifty-five days as the length of his lunar year instead of three hundred and fifty-four, and this in twenty-four years, three octennial periods, produced an error of twenty-four days. This error was exactly compensated by intercalating only sixty-six days, 90 to 24, in the third octennial period. The intercalations were generally made in the month of February, after the 23rd of the month. Their management was left to the pontiffs, ad metamiandum solis unde orsi essent, dies congruent, that the days might correspond to the same starting point of the sun in the heavens whence they had set out. That is, taking for instance the Tropic of Cancer for the place or starting point of the sun any one year, and observing that he was in that point of the heavens on precisely the 21st of June, the object was so to dispense the year. That the day on which the sun was observed to arrive at that same meta or starting point again, should also be called the 21st of June, such was the congruity aimed at by these intercalations. I'll nefastus erit per quem tria verba silenter. Fastus erit, per quem leg lice bit agita, ov. f i. 47. Ancilia, from Gamma Kappa Upsilon Lambda Omicron. Pontificum, Sil. Maximum. Elicient Scylla te, Jupiter, unde minoris. Nunc quoque te celebrant, Elysium quocant. Ov. F. 3. 327. Cum ipsi se, formarent, tum finitum idiom, etc. Some of the editors of Livy have remarked on this passage, that come when answering to tum may be joined to a subjunctive, as here. The fact however is, that come here does not answer to tum at all, come is here, whilst, and so necessarily requires the verb to be in the subjunctive mood. Metis. Gronovius and Becker read Medius, Niebuhr also prefers Medius. He conceives that the Latin prenomena and the Roman nomina terminated in ius. Injurias et non reditas, etc. The construction is, et ego vider a dis regem nostrum cluilium, pre se fere, injurias et non reditas res. Nec dubito te fere idem pre te, tool. 
Three brothers born at one birth. Dionys. 3, 14, describes them as cousin Germans. Vid, Watchsmith, page 147. Niebuhr, I, page 342. The order is, Fortuna Patrii deigned Futura ea quam ipsi f, animo avers. The fortune of their country, the high or humble character of which for the future depended on their exertions on that occasion. The two Roman champions, we have seen, fell in the one place, super alium alias, consequently were buried together. Whilst the Curiatii fell in different places, as Horatius contrived to separate them to avoid their joint attack. Perduelio, Dulum, Bellum, high treason against the state or its sovereign. But in those times any offense deserving capital punishment was included under that of treason, ca Horatio Perduelinum judicent, to pass sentence on Horatius, as being manifestly guilty of murder, not to try whether he was guilty or not. Duumvirai, etc. Niebuhr considers these to be the very words of the old formula. If the sentence, of the Duumvirai, be confirmed by the people. The letter of the law allowed of no justification or extenuation of the fact. It left no alternative to the judge. He kindly pointed out the loophole in the law, which left an opening for the culprit's acquittal. By the laws of Romulus, a father had the power of life and death over his children. The part which he reserves for himself and the Albans is to play the traitors to Tullus in the hour of need, wearing meanwhile the mark of friendship to Rome. The fact is, that the subject population rose up against the Roman colonists, drove them out of the town, and asserted their independence. Neb. I. 24. 5. The Tiber and the Anio. Irrigid, he makes it halt, from the French fair alti, or formerly oat, because soldiers then stand upright and hold their spears erect. Precones of Extremo. At the farther part of the Roman camp, where it joined that of the Albans. As well as by the orders issued by Tullus. Malicious am. Tau nu lambda aden nu kappa alpha lambda omicron upsilon mu nu aden nu kappa alpha kappa omicron rho gamma omicron nu dio. 3. The Lucumones were a class of persons among the Etrurians of a warlike sacerdotal character, patricians, not kings. Vid, Niebuhr, I, page 372. In my version of this passage I have followed the reading, E. Plirac in Radibus, Impacta Sublicis Cum Herent, P. I. The burning logs were not sent down the river one by one, but were placed on rafts, so that being incapable of passing on between the piers of the bridge, they firmly stuck there, and burnt the bridge. This mode of interpretation is confirmed by Dion. 3, 5, 6. The bridge here meant is the one built by the Sabines at the confluence of the Anio and the Tiber, another reading is, Plirac and Radibus impacta sublicius quam herent, most of them being driven against the boats, resting on piles, stuck there. And k. The hundredth year. 138 years had elapsed since the death of Romulus, they diminished the number of years designedly, to make the matter appear still worse. Son-in-law. Why not one of his two sons, Lucius and Aruns? Dio. 4, 1. If these were not his grandchildren rather, they must have been infants at the time. Dio. 4, 4, 6. Dot, at this time infants could not succeed to the throne. Dot, Ruperti. This sentence has given some trouble to the commentators. Some will have it that three distinct reasons are given for assassinating Tarquinius rather than Servius Tullius, and that these are severally marked and distinguished by E.T. Tum, the second only having Kia. Stroth will have it that only two reasons are assigned, one, why the king should be killed, and the other, why Servius Tullius should not be killed, arising from the danger and uselessness of the act, the former has not a Kia, because it was a fact. E.T. Injuri Dolor, and k. While the latter has it in the first part, the danger, e kia gravier, and k, kia being understood also before the other, the uselessness, tum, servio axiso, and k. Because it contained the reasoning of the youths. Doring says there were only two powerful reasons, revenge and fear, and a ratio probabilis introduced by tum, which has the force of an super. 
according to Dr. Hunter, there are two formal assertions, one, that resentment stimulated the sons of Ancus against the king himself, the other, that the plot is laid for the king himself upon two considerations, of reason and policy. By public, private. The public were the steps taken by Servius to establish his political ascendancy, whilst the private refer to those intended to strengthen his family connections. The truce had now expired. If the truce concluded with them by Romulus be here meant, it was long since expired, since about 140 years had now elapsed. It is probable, however, that it was renewed in the reign of Tullius. Varro, the LL4. 36, thinks, on the contrary, that tributum was so called, as being paid by the tribes. Temple of Diana. Built on the summit of the Aventine Mount towards the Tiber. On its brazen pillar were engraved the laws of the treaty, and which were still extant in the time of Augustus. This is noticed as the first trace of the agrarian division by Niebuhr, I, page 161. His son. Dionysius will have it that he was the grandson. See Neb. I, page 367. Younger families. These had been brought into the Senate, as we have seen, by Tarquinius Priscus, and consequently favored the Tarquinian interest. Neb. I, page 372. To resign. Niebuhr is of opinion that what is said regarding the commentaries of Servius Tullius, chapter 60, has reference to this. Hurdle, a mode of punishment in use among the Carthaginians. See Tac. Germ. 12, similar to the Greek, Kappa Alpha Tau Alpha Pi Omicron Nu Tau Oda Sigma Mu. His degeneracy, degeneratum. This use of the passive participle is of frequent occurrence in Livy. The principal sewer, the cloaca maxima. This is attributed to Tarquinius Priscus by several writers. Dio. 3. 67, states that it was he who commenced it. C. Plin. H. N. 36. Neb. I. Page 385. To do so, and that quickly, a use of the participles facto and maturato similar to that already noticed in chapter 53, Degeneratum. All were called patres conscripti. Sil. Patres eti conscripti, the conjunction being omitted. Neb. I, page 517. Collatinus is supposed to have earned the odium of the people, and his consequent expulsion from Rome, by his endeavors to save his nephews, the Aquilii, from punishment. Niebuhr will have it that Brutus punished his children by his authority as a father, and that there was no appeal to the people from the father. See Neb. I, page 488. Animo Patris, the strength of his mind, though that of a father, being even more conspicuous, and So Drakenborch understands the passage, this sternness of mind, he says, though he was their father, was a more remarkable spectacle than his stern countenance. This character of Brutus, as inferable from the words thus interpreted, coincides with that given of him by Dionysius and others. I prefer understanding the passage with Crevier, Sill. Symptoms of paternal affection to his children displaying themselves during the discharge of his duty in superintending the public punishment inflicted on them. Previously, by the institution of Servius, only such manumitted slaves were admitted to the rights of citizenship as were registered by their masters in the census. Uno plus Tuscorum. Nu pi lambda epsilon omicron upsilon nu tau mu chi tau epsilon theta nu kappa alpha sigma iota tau upsilon eta nu nu omega mu alpha omega nu. A year, sil. Of ten months. The Horatii being of the minoris patres. Neb. I, page 533. Funesta familia, as having in it an unburied corpse. Thus Messinus, whilst unburied, incest at funir classum. Verb. Ain, 6. 150. He here rejected the omen. CIC, I. 7, 14, Auguria aut ablativa sunt, quae non poscunter, aut impetrativa, Quae optata venient. The latter could not be rejected. Lar. 
this is generally understood to have been a title of honor equivalent to our term lord. Arbitrium signifies not only the privilege, but the rent paid for such privilege or right of monopoly. Was all taken into the hands of government. In my version of this passage I have conformed to the emendation of the original first proposed by Gronovius, and admitted by Stroth and Becker, Sill. In publicum omni sumptum. They did not let these salt works by auction, but took them into their own management, and carried them on by means of persons employed to work on the public account. These salt works, first established at Ostia by Ancus, were, like other public property, farmed out to the publicans. As they had a high rent to pay, the price of salt was raised in proportion. But now the patricians, to curry favor with the plebeians, did not let the salt pits to private tenants, but kept them in the hands of public laborers, to collect all the salt for the public use. And appointed salesmen to retail it to the people at a cheaper rate. See Stalker's Ed. The Origin. Niebuhr mentions a more probable one. See Nieb. I, page 541, 2. Page 204. Niebuhr thinks, that from this defeat of the Etrurians may be dated the commencement of the recovery of their liberty by the Romans, and that the flight of the Roman hostages, the sale of Porcina's goods, and were subsequent to it. NEC cabus consolibus param creditum sit, sil. Fides non habita furit. Arnold in his Roman history considers this to have been the true cause of creating a dictator. Eo magus quat prop terrici. From this one would be disposed to suspect that the dictator was created to take on him the management of war. See Neb. Page 553, and Neb. Epit. By twists, append. Page 355. By giving up the advantage of their horses, and forgetting their superiority of rank. The consuls secundum quastum, who were the consuls that came after certain consuls. The determination of the plebeians and senators. Rem non vulgabat, was not for extending the relief to all. i.e. by deepening the files. On the opposite side. Gronovius proposes instead of adversus to read aversus, sill. The valleys behind them, or in their rear. I have here adopted the reading of Stacker and others, sill. Ad terrorum, ut solit, prima mortis. i.e. I think it might have been done, whether it would have been right to do so, it is not so easy to decide. Livy means to say that it was possible enough for the senators, by lowering the price of corn, to get rid of the tribunes, and such a judgment is easily formed. It is not, however, he says, so easy to determine, whether it would have been expedient to follow the advice of Coriolanus. I. E. The Senate found themselves reduced to the necessity of delivering one up to the vengeance of the people, in order to save themselves from the further consequences of plebeian rage. The same as the Circensis. Realized, representatives, quasi presentis factus, oculi subjectus, presented as it were to the sight the rash. Sequius sit, otherwise than as it should be. Audience secunda irae verba, attentively listening to words which fanned, or chimed in with, their anger. St. Sill. Rome. Dionysius narrates the expedition of Coriolanus in a different order from that given by Livy, and says that he approached the city twice. Niebuhr, 2. Page 94, n. 535, thinks that the words, passing across the country into the Latin way, in Latinum vium transversus itineribus transgressus, have been transposed from their proper place, and that they should come in after, he then took, and tunk de inceps. The triarii were veteran soldiers of approved valor, they formed the third line, whence their name. Before a consul set out on any expedition, he offered sacrifices and prayers in the capital. And then, laying aside his consular gown, marched out of the city, dressed in a military robe of state, called polutamentum. This statement is rejected by Niebuhr entirely. Niebuhr, 2. p. 231, 
thinks that it was in this year the Icilian law was passed, according to which any person interrupting the proceedings of the tribunes, rendered himself liable to capital punishment, twists. Several charges were brought against Appius, according to Dion. 9. 54 who also states that he did not die of any disease, but that he laid violent hands on himself. Ruperti. The original has plenus suarum, irarum, that is, the anger not of Appius against the commons, but of the commons against him. Sionef Neb. 2, n. 754. It may be well to mention that Niebuhr considered that this account regarding the death of Appius was all fictitious. The Greek writers, Sil. Dion. 9, 54, Zonar. 7, 17, state that he laid violent hands on himself. In the original we read Coacti Extemplo Obsenatu. Niebuhr considers this reading to be corrupt, and is satisfied that the correct reading is Coacto Extemplo Senatu. C2. N. 555. Additional force of the end. Crovier understands this to signify that the Romans did not employ a greater force for besieging Antium, than they had employed the preceding year, and which at that time seemed insufficient for the purpose. Others understand the words to signify that they surrendered without waiting for the Romans to make any additional efforts to take the town. Didi Rat. The Oratio Obliqua would require deterit here, but such instances of the indicative being used for the subjunctive are by no means infrequent. Justitium, a jure sustendo. According to Strath, this is the first instance we have of a decree of the Senate arming the consul with almost dictatorial power. Proconsul, the first mention of a proconsul in Livy. Of the year, i.e. the consular year, not the civil one, which commenced in January. A similar measure was adopted at Athens. See Thucyd. 2.52. Circicio. Stroth observes, that this is what we understand by, the round. According to Dionysius, the Volsci attacked Rome on this occasion. As Prefectus Urbis. Nibur N. 24, 634, would have us read Tarentilius, the Roman family names always, he says, ending in Ius. He also thinks that for Arsa, we should read Harsa. Nibur, 2. N. 631, asks whether it was worms. Sigma Alpha Rho Kappa Nu Theta Rho Alpha Sigma Mu Alpha Tau Alpha. Dion. X. 2. The Sibylline Books. Niebuhr denies that the tribunes had the power before the establishment of the Decemberi to commit patricians to prison. See however Dion. 7. 17. In the original the words are, Medio decreto jus auxilii sui expedient. The tribunes were afraid lest, if they allowed Kiso to go entirely at large, the commons might become irritated. Whilst if they refused to listen to the application of a patrician when he craved their assistance, they feared lest they should lose an excellent opportunity of establishing their influence and increasing their power. By adopting a line of conduct then which conceded something both to the commons and to Kiso, they as it were extricate, expedient, their power from this double danger. Vadis Publicos. According to Gronovius, Publico, Sil. Plebe. Niebuhr prefers this reading. Rigorously exacted. See Niebuhr 2. Page 289, who expresses a different opinion on the matter. Inserto host, it being as yet uncertain who the enemy was. Fidem abrigare, non habira fidem, non credere. Non credendo here seems superfluous. Forgetful of the consular, enc. i.e. forgetful of the limits of the consular authority, acting in the same manner as if its power were unbounded, and admitted no appeal. Niebuhr thinks that Kiso was among the number. See Cap. 25, where we read, Casinum nec quincii familii, nec rea publici restitui posse. Comp. Niebuhr 2. N. 673, Watchsmith, page 347. The consuls under ordinary circumstances used to commence their office at this time on the calends of August. Nec sacri nec sancti. Whatever is consecrated by religion is said to be sacrum. 
whilst sanctum is said of that which the law states to be inviolable. Exercitu relicto is the ordinary reading. Crevier observes that reducto is the more correct. This account does not seem to be correct. See Niebuhr 2. Page 254. Ni eta eset, a legal form of expression, amounting in this place to, if Valtius attempted to deny it. Privatum. Besides the questors who by virtue of their office were to prosecute Valtius, many persons on their own account, and on their private responsibility, cited him into court and challenged him to discuss the case before a judge. A prosecutor was said for a judicium res, when he proposed to the accused person someone out of the judices selecti, before whom the case might be tried. If the accused person consented to the person named by prosecutor, then the judge was said convenus, to have been agreed on. Sometimes the accused was allowed to select his own judge, judicium dicera. When both the prosecutor and the accused agreed as to the judge, they presented a joint petition to the praetor that he would appoint, ut derit, that person to try the cause. At the same time they both bound themselves to pay a certain sum, the one if he did not establish his charge, ni eta eset, the other if he did not prove his innocence. Commissia, i, e. Curiata, which exercised authority in the cases of persons accused of inflicting injuries on the patricians. Ad proabenda circumdari opera. Stroth observes that it should be more properly ad proabenda circumdanda opera, i, e. Ad proabendum, any opera circumdurenter. Consular, imperium tribunitio auxilio. The consuls possessed imperium. The tribunes could not be said to possess it. Their province was confined to auxilii latio, sc adversus consuls. It is extraordinary that Livy makes no mention here of Sixius Dentatus, and his strenuous exertions in endeavouring to carry the agrarian law, as well as of his angry contentions with the consuls. For his character, see Dion. X. 31, 32. Impedimentum. The fact of his presiding at the meeting should have been a bar to his being elected a December. Niebuhr will have it that five of these were of plebeian rank. Impotentibus, S.C. Immoderatus, Rari Adidas, the genitive singular. Stroth. N.E.C. Attenuus demi securum, cum sign provocation creati essent, interpreter banter. Valerius Publicola had introduced the custom of not having the axes tied up with the fasces when carried before the consuls in the city. But the December said that this was, because an appeal from the consuls to the people was allowed. Whence, since their jurisdiction allowed of no appeal, they interpreted, i.e. By interpreting the meaning or intention of this custom, they concluded that they were not bound by it, and that there was no reason why they should remove the axes from the fasces. Crev. Provocation, intercessionum. The provocatio was to the people, whilst the intercessio referred to the decembers against a colleague. Quum fortuna, qua quiquid cupidum fore, potentioris esset. Stroth considers this passage to be corrupt, he proposes to read cum fortuna, so that potentioris esset may refer to quiquid cupidum fore, i.e. With such favorable success, that everything which the more powerful person might covet, became his. Inhibendum, sc adhibendum, the term inhibio occurs frequently in this sense, as below, imperioque inhibendo. The adjective immanutis also refers evidently to honoris in signibus. Stroth. The words are, quum et ipsi invisum consensu imperium, in plebs, quid pervatus just non esset vocandi senatum, non convenire pat res interpreterenter, i.e. While, on the one hand, the Decembers themselves accounted for the staying away of the senators from the meeting, by the fact of their, the Decembers, government being disliked by them. Whilst, on the other hand, the commons accounted for the non-appearance of the senators by the fact, that being now mere private citizens, their time of office being passed, they, the Decembers, had no right whatever to convene the Senate, Stroth. The senators were obliged to attend the meeting of the senate when convened by the magistrate, otherwise a fine was imposed, to ensure the payment of which pledges were exacted, which were sold in case of non-payment. See Cicero de Orat. 3, 1. Philip. I, 5. 
In the original the words are, quat i i s k jam magistratu abisant, privatisk, s i vis abesit, and k i e. Who differed in no other respect from mere private citizens, except that they had recourse to violence, which it was competent for the magistrate only to do. Livy's own account of the matter does not justify this claim of the Horatii to having been at the head of the revolution which banished the kings. But Dionysius of Halicarnassus informs us that it was Marcus Horatius who made the army revolt against Tarquinius Superbus, and that the same in his second consulate rendered unavailing all the efforts of Porsena to restore the Tarquins. The original here is rather obscure. A.U.T. Socii, A.U.T. High Maxim. Crevier prefers to read A.U.T. Soli, A.U.T. High Maxim. Stroth explains Socii, S.E. Socios Prebendo. Appius here contrasts two classes of persons, one consisting of individuals, who are in their own power, the other, of those who are not sui juris, but are under the control either of a parent, or some other person. If the question arise concerning a person who is sui juris, whether he is to be consigned to slavery, or to be restored to liberty, then, id juris esse, esse. That he remain free till the decision is made, because any person, as being homo sui juris, and consequently he himself, may proceed by law. But he says, that this does not hold good with respect to a person who is not sui juris, but is in the hands of others. Such a person, he says, cannot be pronounced free, but must be subject to the power either of the parent or master, so that no injury be done to either. Wherefore, since the girl is not sui juris, she must be in the power either of Virginius, who says he is her father, or of Claudius, who says he is her master. But since Virginius is not present, that she can be in the power of no one but Claudius, until Virginius arrived that I cannot resist the temptation of giving in full Mr. Gunn's note on the passage, as found in his very neat edition of our author. Appius for his own purposes, in interpreting his own law, introduces a distinction betwixt those who were sui juris, entirely free, and those who were subject to the patria potestas. The law, according to him, can apply only to the former, because in them only is there a true claim for liberty, and in them only could a judge give an interim decision secundum libertatum. To give such a decision in favor of Virginia, would be a variatio personarum. It would be introducing as entitled to the benefit of the law a class of persons, who were, even according to their own statements, not entitled to vindicii secundum libertatum. Besides, and most important of all, the law could act in the former, as any citizen was entitled to plead the cause of one presumptively free. But in this case no one could plead, but either the father as master on the one hand, or the alleged master on the other, as the father was not present, consequently no one had any legal claim to urge the law. See NEC causes NEC personis variat. SC. Lex variat. Some understand libertas as the nominative to variat. Because any person. As the law permits any strangers to interpose in vindicating an individual's liberty, they have an undoubted right so to do. But the question is not whether this maiden is free, that she cannot be in any case, for she belongs either to her father or her master. Now as her father is not present to take charge of her, no one here but her master can have any title to her. Appius argues that he could not pronounce in favor of her temporary liberty, without prejudice to her father's right and power over her, as there was no one present, who claimed a legal right to the possession of her but M. Claudius, the judge had no alternative but to award her during the interim to his safekeeping. Stalker. Sureties, sponsors. The preliminary bail. He passed a sentence, and k. In the original it is, decres vindicia secundum servitudum. This decision relates to the definitive bail. Appius the day before had made up his mind to this decision. He had calculated, however, on the non-appearance of the father, yet did not now choose to be foiled by his unexpected presence. Stalker. The dress of the citizens. Two classes of persons are here intended, one, those who accompanied Virginius into the camp. Two, others who followed them subsequently. 
In the performance of such rites, the slightest mistake of a word or syllable was deemed highly inauspicious, to prevent which, the regular form of words was pronounced by a priest, and repeated after him by the persons officiating. Villa Publica It was destined to public uses, such as holding the census, or survey of the people, the reception of ambassadors, and Errarium facera, signifies to strip a person of all the privileges of a citizen, on which he became civis errarius, a citizen only so far as he paid taxes. Senators. Niebuhr, 2. Note 995, seems to doubt whether these belonged to single cities or were the senators of the entire Volscian nation. Fines. The fines imposed in early times were certain numbers of sheep or oxen. Afterwards it was ordered by law that these fines should be appraised and the value paid in money. Another law fixed a certain rate at which the cattle should be estimated, 100 asses for an ox, 10 for a sheep. The passing of a senatus consultum, or decree of the senate, might be prevented in several ways, as, for instance, by the want of a sufficiently full meeting, and in such cases the judgment of the majority was recorded, and that was called octorita senatus. The reading of the original here is decidedly incorrect. Various emendations have been attempted, but none can be deemed satisfactory. So I have rendered proesi, or it may be rendered, considering their circumstances, sil. The external circumstances in which they were placed. Expectation, and k. With confident expectations on the part of his countrymen, rather than simple hope. According to Niebuhr, Volume 2. P. 233, this fear put into the mouth of Claudius, is attributable to ignorance or forgetfulness on the part of Livy, of the early usage in the dividing of spoils, which had ceased to be observed in the time of Augustus. According to former Roman usage, half of the conquering army was employed, under the sanction of a solemn oath, to subtract nothing, in collecting the spoil, which was then partly divided by lot, partly sold, and the proceeds. If promised to the soldiers, dispersed to them man by man, if otherwise, it was brought into the treasury. Both schemes mentioned here by Livy, it will be observed, contemplated compensation to the people for the war tax which they had so long paid. But that of Licinius was more favorable, especially to the poor, as the ordinary citizens would receive equal shares, and the compensation would be direct and immediate. Gun. This vow frequently occurs in Grecian history, like that made of the Persian booty, but this is the only instance in the history of Rome. Niebuhr, Volume 2. 239. Evocados. When the Romans besieged a town, and thought themselves sure of taking it, they used solemnly to call out of it the gods in whose protection the place was supposed to be. The idea of the Romans working a mine, even through the soil of Vi, so as to be sure of reaching not only the town and the citadel, and even the temple, is considered by Niebuhr as extremely ridiculous. He deems the circumstance a clear proof of the fiction that attaches to the entire story of the capture of Vi. The whole seems to be an imitation of the siege of Troy. Gun. The passage in the original, in the generality of editions, is read as follows, ut im invidium lenaer, quam minimo soa privato incomodo publico, populo romano liceret, i.e. That both himself and the Roman people may get over the evil consequences of the jealousy of the gods with as little detriment as possible to either, populi Romani seems preferable here, i.e. That it might be allowed to lighten that jealousy, by the least possible injury to his own private interest, and to the public interests of the Roman people. There were certainly two persons concerned in the invidia and incommodum here, Camillus himself, and the Roman people, to whom respectively the damnatio, and Elod's Capti Urbis, afterwards mentioned, obviously refer. Some editions read, Invidium lenire soa privato incommodo, quam minimo publico populi Romani liceret. This is the reading adopted by Crevier, i.e., to appease the jealousy by his own private loss, rather than the least public loss. This is more in accordance with the account given of Camillus by Plutarch, and contains a sentiment certainly more worthy both of Livy and of Camillus. Sentiments ascribed by Plutarch to Camillus, will have soa privato incommodo, quam minimo publico p, r, g. 
giving him the patriotic wish to render light the odium by his own private loss, rather than the least public loss. Or, by his own private loss, but if not, by as small a public loss as possible. Popli are, better than o, o, as Lysret would, in the latter case, apply only to one of the parties, in the former both are understood. A proposal so absurd would have justified the most vehement opposition of the Senate. But it is much more probable, that the scope of the proposition was, that on this occasion the whole of the conquered land should be divided, but amongst the whole nation. So that the patricians also and their clients should receive a share as absolute property. Niebuhr, Volume 2. Page 248. Niebuhr and Arnold understand these words to signify, that these persons had already made up their minds not to acquit him, or assist him by voting in favor of him, in fact, that they could not conscientiously do so. It may, however, signify simply, that the people were so incensed against him, that there existed not a rational prospect of acquittal for him. In my translation of this passage I have differed from Baker, who thus renders, thinking, that as his enemies were few in number, their skill was what he had chiefly to guard against. Duro de la Malle thus translates, Supposant de la Rue's AUX enemies, a raison de leur petit nombre. This is obviously the correct version. The aged were doomed to perish under any circumstances, utique, from scarcity of provisions, whether they retired into the capital with the military youth, or were left behind in the city. The Novensals were nine deities brought to Rome by the Sabines, Lara, Vesta, Minerva, Feronia, Concord, Faith, Fortune, Chance, Health. See Niebuhr 3. 2, 249. Any noise happening during the taking of the auspices was reckoned inauspicious. Hence silentium signified among the augurs, every circumstance being favorable. 